Sandra Borchers. I'm the Chief Development Officer here at PSTA. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to host you. Um, we are very much in the regional mindset and are happy to have meetings like this um, here at PSTA. So thank you all for coming to Pinellas County. Um, if you need anything during the meeting, uh, please tell Witt or Beth. They can make sure that um, uh, one of my staff members knows and can get it for you. Um, if for any reason you need to leave to use the restrooms, there are security doors that we hold open for meetings like this, so you'll be able to use those there. If for any reason there is a fire alarm, and I do not expect anything, so if there is, it is not anything that I'm pre-warning you about. Um, but if there is, please meet at the flagpoles out of the front of the building. Um, we will make sure that there is a staircase at the back of the building. So if you have to get out, um, Wayne actually knows where it is because I took him there um, earlier today. I'm first out. So follow out <laughs> towards, <laughs> follow out towards the restrooms and uh, keep going down down the back stairs. You can also go out uh, to the lake in the back of our property. So thank you again. Have a very successful meeting. We're looking forward to how you prioritize things. Okay, as we get started, I think it would be good, since we have some new faces here in the room, to do, go around and do some introductions. Uh, so if I can start to my right. I'm Craig Casper. I'm the MPO manager for Pasco County. I'm Jack Mariano, commissioner in Pasco County, also a member of the TMA and the MPO. Camille Hernandez, mayor of Dade City and chair of the Pasco MPO. I'm David Gwynn, district secretary, FDOT District 7. Good morning, Beth Alden, director for the Hillsborough MPO. Uh, good morning, Sandy Merman. Chair of the Hillsborough County Commission and member of the MPO and Hart and TMA. I'm uh, Harry Cohen, Tampa City Council, the Vice Chair of the Hillsborough MPO and also a TMA member. I'm Pat Kemp, Hillsborough County Commissioner, member of TBARDA, TMA, Hart, and the MPO. Doreen Caudell, City Clearwater Council member, Vice Chair before Pinellas' MPO and TMA board member and MPOCCC chair. <laughs> Jim Kennedy, City of St. Petersburg, City Council, Forward Pinellas, and uh, TMA. John Targus, City of Dunedin, Commissioner, a member of the MPO, and a member of TMA. Willie Charles Shaw, Commissioner of the City of Sarasota, and Chair of the Manatee Sarasota MPO. And Dave Hutchinson, Director of Sarasota Manatee MPO. Dave Eggers, Pinellas County Commission, um, also on MPO and TMA, and the PSTA. Nice to be here. I'm a really nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm Wayne Dukes. I'm the Board of uh, Chamber of uh, President. What am I again? I'm the Board, uh, County Commission Board Director, and I am uh, an MPO and a member of T. Barda. Hi, uh, Dennis Dixon. I've never heard so many acronyms in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just getting started. Then. Yeah. Uh, chair of the Hernando Citrus at MPO. Larry Johnson, Vice Mayor, City of South Pasadena, Member Board Pinellas, MPO. Yes. I'm Ronnie Blackshear, Long Range Planning Director with Polk County, and also the Polk TPO Director. Laura Harsher with FDOT District One, and I'm the Intermodal Systems Development Manager. If we could quickly go around the folks with that. Anthony Mentanti with T. Barta. Johnny Wallen, Hillsborough MPO. Cassandra Borchers, PSTA. Dave Sobush, Tampa Bay Partnership. Ray Charmonti, T. Barta. Bill Johnson, Forward Pinellas and PSTA. Hugh Pasco, T. Barta. Rafael Montalvo, Consensus Center and TMA Facilitator. Bob Esposito, Florida Department of Transportation, Government Affairs. Clarence and Kimley Horn, Chair of the Tampa Innovation Alliance Advisory Board. Janet Sherberger, Tampa International Airport. Tom Allen, City of St. Petersburg. Michael Case, T. Barna. Marco Sandusky, Hart. Great Christina Kopp, WSB. Ryan Cordick with the Folk DPO staff. Ann Kulik with the West Shore Alliance. Andrew Kennedy, Department of Transportation, District 7. Wade Reynolds, Hillsborough MPO. Anthony Palmieri, T. Barna, CSC, and Hernando Citrus, MPO, CSC. Excellent. Well, we've got a great group, but a lot of combined acronyms, so I'm glad to have uh, both our TMA folks and our CCC folks here today as well. Um, I guess I first want to start with the approval of the meeting summary from the last meeting. Is there um, a motion to approve or any comments or questions about the meeting summary? Motion to approve. Okay, motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. 
And then uh, let's take any public comments. Uh, if there's anyone who would like to speak public, uh, publicly to uh, any of the items that are on the agenda or not on the agenda that may be relevant to our folks this morning, please step forward. Okay, not seeing any of that. Let's move on to our presentations then. And Dave Sobush will kick us off. Uh, good morning, everybody. Well, Anthony's getting the presentation loaded. Uh, I am Dave Sobush. I'm the Director of Policy and Research at the Tampa Bay Partnership. On behalf of Rick Holmans, our President and CEO, and the investors of the Tampa Bay Partnership, we really appreciate the opportunity to share uh, findings from our regional competitiveness report uh, with you today. And, and uh, you know, I, I guess that's best to blame. I mean, thanks for um, you know being here uh, on December 1st. Normally, I'm very superstitious and on the first of the month. Uh, but today, uh, I'm happy to be here. Uh, full screen mode control help. That covered that. Uh, so this is the Regional Competitiveness Report. Uh, we released it um, on November 14th at a State of the Region event at USF. I, I know that many of you were in the audience that day, and thank you for being there. Um, the Regional Competitiveness Report uh, was a year-plus long process. Uh, that was uh, led by the partnership, but we had a very strong collaboration with both the Community Foundation of Tampa Bay as well as United Way Suncoast. And it's important, um, you know, number one, that you know there's you know many organizations, uh, you know, supporting this this process and, and this document. Uh, but also, you know, the partnership represents a lot of you know business interests. But when you think about the audience and the constituency of the Community Foundation of Tampa Bay and United Way Suncoast, we get more of a comprehensive uh, uh, cross-section of you know, the residents and, and businesses of, of the Tampa Bay region. Um, you know, benchmarking reports and the regional competitiveness report is a benchmarking report, is, is a best practice um, that we see in most major metro areas. Uh, we found that both when we were executing the partnerships pivot from uh, business development marketing public policy and advocacy and we continue to find it when we were investigating best practices in specific reports um, the tampa bay region has made you know some preliminary efforts in this uh, area before um, you know uh, back in the early part of uh, the 2000s we had something called the economic market report which was published by a, a now defunct Center uh, for Economic Development Research at the University of South Florida. And then of course you had the Tampa Bay Partnership um, you know, that, that led a regional economic scorecard effort from roughly 2004 to 2011. Uh, but we felt that you know, um, it was time to you know, re-engage in these efforts. And if you're seeking to transform a region, if you're seeking to you know, fix the problems uh, you know, that, that, that hold back economic competitiveness and prosperity, you got to know what those problems are. You know? And the old adage of you can't measure, you can't prove it, you know, certainly holds true in this regard. Um, so the partnership's um, you know, method of, of tackling you know, this process was you know, to, uh, much like you see in, in, in many organizations, was to establish a, a regional indicators task force. It was chaired by Chuck Sykes. Um, I was um, simultaneously thrilled and scared when I found out that Chuck was going to be the chair. Um, you know, thrilled because I knew that he was the right leader for it. Scared because I couldn't, you know, use the Dave Sobush power of persuasion on Chuck Sykes. He would really want to know that things were uh, true. Um, you know, and, you know, but beyond sort of the. You know, the, the inner circle of the partnership and Community Foundation United Way Suncoast, we really felt it was important to reach out into the community. We contacted more than 170 organizations. We were proud that 90 uh, organizations participated in this process, many of whom are represented in this room today. So we thank you and, uh, you know, as appropriate, your staff for their, you know, uh, engagement in this effort. Um, as I've said many times, it's, it would be very easy for me to just, you know, like hunker down for a week and come up with a set of indicators, a set of comparison markets, uh, you know, and produce a benchmarking report. But then that's Dave Sobosch's, you know, benchmarking report. It doesn't have, you know, much adoption or consensus from the community. So we felt it was very important to cast a very wide net, hear a lot of perspectives about, you know, what's important, you know, within the community, what is important, uh, you know, to the customers that these groups seek to serve. Um, and we ended up with 60 indicators of economic competitiveness and prosperity. 
and we present them, you know, one by one in a 64-page, uh, you know, four-color uh, publication. Um, we also present a summary in the document, and, and I'll pause right here. If, if you're interested in seeing a copy of the report, it's available at regionalcompetitiveness.org, and I'll have that website, um, you know, in the presentation later on. We don't um, provide a score, you know, and we don't say, here's the number one market, here's the number 20 market. Um, there's a variety of reasons for doing that, but we understand human nature says, well, how does this all look across all these indicators, all these communities? So there is a, um, a summary of you know, performance in these indicators. And there are some areas where Tampa Bay performs very well, um, specifically our measurements of economic vitality. There are some areas where Tampa Bay performs poorly. Um, those are in our measures of talent. Um, across the rest of you know the the metrics, um, you'd say that Tampa Bay is roughly at, at the the median or slightly below the median. And you know one thing that was important, what Chuck really brought to the process, he's a he's a huge advocate of the work of uh, Dr. Kaplan from uh, Harvard Business School and his process of strategy mapping. He says we need to have kind of a framework to organize our thinking around this, and so. Our framework that we adopted, it's a circle to represent that it is kind of a complex system. It's not a hierarchy, you know, where one thing leads to another. But we have our indicators in different buckets of civic quality, talent, economic vitality, innovation, and infrastructure. Uh, those are kind of the leading indicators um, and, and the things that we can work on as a community. The blue arrows in the middle that kind of reference each other, those represent the customers of a region. Um, you know, most of us that represent either a civic or a government group, we are going to be here one way or the other, and our fortunes are going to rise and fall as our customers' fortunes rise or fall. Our customers, which are residents and businesses, make a choice every day to be here or not. Um, and so we need to make sure that we are meeting their needs, um, and, you know, the arrows pointing at each other represent the symbiotic relationship between residents and businesses. Businesses need residents for a market, and they also need them for workforce. Residents need businesses for goods and services and also for employment opportunities. And at the center of the, the framework here are, are the economic competitiveness and prosperity outcomes, which, and, and we'll get into them in a little bit, they basically represent very, very high level, you know, how are we doing type, you know, uh, metrics. Is the economy growing? More importantly, is it inclusive and an are all groups participating in the growth of the economy? And is Tampa Bay a place that people want to be? Uh, so more on that to come. Um, you know, context matters. Um, there's a great picture, you know, this would be a great place to show it, but I didn't, of the, uh, the, 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 the Belmont stakes that Secretariat, you know, uh, you know, just literally ran away with. He won by, you know, 20 plus lengths. And he's so far ahead, the jockey's looking over his shoulder saying, where are the other horses? And so there is a horse that finished, you know, almost, you know, uh, half a mile behind Secretariat. But that horse can, you know, say, I finished second. Um, but context matters in both sort of a normative and a, um, and, and, and a real way. Uh, these are the communities that we picked. The best practice that we saw in the reports we took a look at was to pick a mix of peer or competitive markets, as well as those that you you kind of realize our aspirational markets. And I think as you look at this list of 19 markets, including Tampa Bay, uh, equaling 20, uh, you'll see that there's some markets for which, you know, these are our peers, these are competitors, and there's some that, you know, say, gosh, wouldn't it be great if in 10 years we were kind of mirroring the performance of, of that market? Um, halfway through this process, we got a great gift that kind of validated our um, our metrics and our framework. Uh, it was when Amazon, you know, in a very public fashion, uh, you know, released their RFP for HQ2. And, you know, listed here on the left-hand side are the things that Amazon was looking for. And we were pleased to see, hey, you know, if this is what Amazon's looking for. These are largely the things that we are including in our report. We're on the right track. Um, the good news from the economic competitiveness report um, is that, you know, in terms of job creation, you know, uh, Tampa Bay and Florida is performing very well. Uh, in the year period that we took a look at, there was, you know, 67,000 new jobs created in the eight-county Tampa Bay market. So the 
Tampa Bay, as it's in the report, mirrors um, the, the, the West Central Florida T bar to CCC uh, you know, uh, footprint. And it was you know, 3.68% job growth. Uh, number two in Florida, Orlando, the Orlando MSA was number one. Um, you know, jobs are important. You know, without you know people having a job, you know, almost anything else you're trying to do becomes more difficult. Um, so, you know, no, doing well in job growth, also doing very well in terms of how the share of advanced industries are growing as as a um, in terms of their productivity within the economy. Uh, so, advanced industries, which include things like computer systems design and advanced manufacturing. Uh, the, the gross regional product attributable to those industries grew, you know, almost by a third in the year that we took a look at. And, you know, compared to, you know, some, you know, high-tech hubs like Austin, Seattle, and Raleigh-Durham, you know, we performed very well on an annual growth basis. Um, our transportation network, this is a transportation-focused group, our transportation network is performing very well for a certain segment of the population, those with cars. Um, so we rank, um, you know, third in, in our group of 20 in terms of the amount of driving time spent in congestion. And congestion they define as, um, you know, I think it's 60% uh, of the posted speed limit. I know that there's some drivers I encountered today that, you know, 100% of the speed limit is congestion. Um, our average commutes, uh, you know, are, are pretty good relative to the, to the rest of the group. And, you know, kind of our, our share of commuters that have a, a super commute, hour plus, we rank just below the median in that regard. Um, some of the challenges, and I mentioned them earlier, uh, and Anthony, I think you'll, you'll distribute the, the deck to the group afterward. Um, some of the challenges, as I mentioned, are in the area of talent. Uh, these are some very high level metrics of uh, talent within the marketplace. When we talk about educational attainment, we're referring to you know, what is the last degree that, you know, a person 25 years or older within their region has uh, received or achieved? Um, 19th or 20th, so last or second to last in each of these educational attainment metrics. Now, those don't always refer to very specific skills. As we know, sometimes that, you know, there's a skills mismatch. The skills that somebody receives at an institution of higher education may not match the demand of employers within the marketplace. And uh, we, we find that out, you know, pretty clearly. Um, you know, one of the things we do take a look at, again, slicing the data a little bit more, is that bottom one, the share of population aged 25 to 34, which is demographer speak for millennials. The share of population aged 25 to 34 with a bachelor's degree or more. So, you know, we, we have a, you know, strong growth and we see that in some of our outcomes in terms of millennial population. Uh, but relative to other markets, our millennials are, are less educated than millennials in, in other markets. And that's not Gen X bias, I promise. So. <laughs> um, but, you know, despite, you know, these talent, you know, um, educational attainment deficits, we're doing a great job in terms of producing degrees. Right? So this is somewhat perplexing in that you know, uh, all of the institutions of higher education uh, on a per capita basis, we rank just below the median in terms of production of associate's degrees and higher. And we take a look at STEM degrees, we're doing even better in terms of relative to the population. We are seventh among the, um, the comparison cohort. My boss Rick Holmans isn't here so I can say things like comparison cohort. And, um, but, you know, so it's perplexing because if we're producing the graduates, where are they going and how come it's not being reflected in our educational attainment metrics? Um, somewhat even more concerning when we talk about that pipeline, when you look at the age 25 to 64, relatively, you know, the working age population, the labor force participation rate, this is the employed and the unemployed, so people that have a job and people that are looking for a job, we rank 20th in the marketplace. Um, I believe when I looked at the numbers, if we were to you know, move from 20th to 10th, you know, and that would be roughly moving from 74% to 80%, it would be the number of workers equal to the entire population of the city of Clearwater. So if we have a, a deficit of, you know, uh, of workers, and if we have this perceived talent shortage, um, you know, by moving to the median, these are just people that are of working age that are on the sidelines. If we were able to move them into the labor force, we'd be adding about 110,000 workers to the regional workforce. 
And then also somewhat concerning is our young people, age 16 to 24. There is a relatively high number of those folks that are neither in school nor are they in a, in a job. Okay, they're just sitting on the sidelines. They're not adding skills either at the workplace or in a classroom. Um, and so when we talk about filling that pipeline going forward, that is, that is somewhat concerning. Um, no surprise here, 20th in transit supply. And we measure transit supply by vehicle revenue miles per capita. And 20th in transit ridership. You'd expect those to be somewhat hand in hand. Um, you know, and as I mentioned before, uh, you know, our transportation network performs very well relative to these other markets for folks with a car. If you do not have a car, um, you are, you know, somewhat limited in the way that you engage with the, the community. Okay, if you picture a mother that, you know, maybe works in Sarasota, the child goes to school in Bradenton, very difficult for that mother to get back to a parent-teacher conference at, you know, 3 p.m. without taking a significant amount of time away from work. Difficult, you know, for, you know, a family without a vehicle to, you know, get to a little league game up in Tarpon Springs at 6 p.m. without taking a significant time off of work. And, you know, furthermore, uh, you know, it is limited opportunity, you know, for these folks. When you have limited mobility, uh, the people without a car, um, their, their progress in moving up the economic ladder is stunted, and they're limited to the options, uh, economic options, that they can, uh, you know, reach on their feet or, or through pedals. And, you know, that's pretty dangerous for them. Um, when we look at the pedestrian and cyclist fatalities within these 20 markets, Tampa Bay ranks 19. 20, 19, 18, and 17, Florida. Um, you know, so that, and it's, it, it's a big jump from 16 to 17. Um, and so people, you know, might be putting their life in their hand to uh, achieve some different economic outcomes for themselves and their family. Um, you know, I do want to, you know, call attention, you know, to the good efforts that are underway to ameliorate the situation. You know, one of them is the, the regional trails that Tibarda works on, you know, very closely. Um, you know, FDOT's number one priority, as we heard in our stakeholder, um, you know, interviews is, you know, safety. And, you know, must certainly, you know, applaud the efforts of, you know, Vision Zero uh, in Hillsborough County. And I know other efforts are moving forward throughout the community to achieve a goal of zero uh, traffic fatalities uh, within the community. Um, so back to, you know, what this is all about, economic competitiveness and prosperity. Uh, we talk about the economy is growing, and hey, our economy is growing. That's great. You know, um, we rank third in terms of economic uh, growth as measured by GRP. Um, it's from a somewhat, you know, strong base. Uh, so we're not talking about a little number to a you know somewhat larger little number. Uh, but you know, Tampa Bay is you know the you know 19th largest economy in the United States. Um, and you know we see some good economic growth in the aggregate throughout Florida. Um, you know with Jacksonville at seventh, South Florida, and Orlando somewhat below the median. But on a per capita basis, you know when you take a look at again how is how is economic growth being, if it was spread equally across the populace, uh, it is 20th. It is 20th and it is significantly lower than number 19. Five thousand dollars per capita uh, are almost you know um, yeah almost 18, 15 percent below Jacksonville. And then take a look at Seattle down there, which is twice the GRP per capita of Tampa Bay. Um, in terms of other inclusionary metrics, how well is economic growth being shared within you know, the, the residents of Tampa Bay? We rank 17th among you know, the comparison communities in terms of our youth that live in poverty. And also, even if you have a full-time job, you work full-time, um, you know, we rank 13th in terms of those folks uh, that, that still live in impoverished conditions. Um, our unemployment rate, while historically low for Tampa Bay, in the context of the communities with which we are comparing ourselves, it, it does not perform as well as, as the other communities. Um, but yet we continue to attract new residents, and that's a good thing. Um, you know, our you know, net migration rate, so this is you know, the population growth attributable to new residents as opposed to the net effect of births and deaths. Uh, we rank third among the benchmark communities. Our millennial in migration, so the number of millennials that live here now that didn't live here a year ago, 7.63% um, of the population aged 25 to 34 did not live here last year. That ranks 14th amongst the benchmark communities. 
Um, so we are not attracting, you know, new millennials to the to the region as uh, as fast as uh, you know the other ones. Um, you know, a, mo a word about growth. You know, there there are some you know so there are some challenges that come with growth. It's increased pressure on social services, on education, on safety, etc. Um, but imagine how much we talked a little bit about the challenges that face this region. Imagine how much more difficult it would be to address those challenges if you were a St. Louis that is losing population, if you were some of the other communities that are basically flatlined in terms of their, their population growth. So we need to leverage the growth we have. We need to make sure that, you know, in addition to economic growth, we are actually economically developing, uh, you know, to kind of move the needle forward on, on some of these things. Um, I want to say a word about, you know, one way in which I've been doing this type of work for a long time. Both of those other benchmarking reports you saw uh, had my fingerprints on them figuratively and literally. And um, so I've been doing community benchmarking in the Tampa Bay region off and on for 15 years and watching it around, around the nation. I've never seen, you know, this academic partnership that we had with the USF Muma College of Business, which is, okay, we've got these indicators. Tell us which ones really matter and how they affect, you know, if you, you know, push this one, how it affects some of the outcomes we want to achieve. So we worked with the Center for uh, Creative Analytics at the USF College of uh, Business. Um, they are, you know, big data types. And, you know, this is going to be in a forthcoming paper that they are going to be putting out. Um, these are more than correlations. This is what's called panel data. It's a more robust statistical analysis. Um, where it explains some of the causality between these things. So they took all of our data, they went back, you know, 10 or 15 years with all these communities to get enough of a sample. And they saw that, you know, if you raise your educational attainment within a region, you're adding $233 to per capita GRP. If you raise your educational attainment among graduate and professional degrees, you're adding even more because those, um, those folks add a higher, you know, value to the economy. If you grow businesses within your community, if you work to develop entrepreneurs across a spectrum of economic activity, uh, you have a, it's a smaller, but it's statistically significant growth in GRP per capita. And if you add transit to a community's supply of transit uh, by one mile per capita, you add $234 to per capita GRP. So almost more than you do if you raise the uh, bachelor's degree in higher educational attainment. Um, I'll pause right now for any questions. That was somewhat rapid fire. Um, I'll say, ask your questions now because I got to go. <laughs> Ray. Okay. Uh, have you looked at why some of these statistics come out uh, the way they do? And I'll then I'll add my questions. Is why I'm asking that question. Um, like percent of the labor force being low between 25 and 64, could part of that be that people up north sometimes make a decision, like my dad did, to retire early and move to Florida? And it, he doesn't want, he didn't want to be in the workforce? It could be. Um, but, you know, we have in our, there again, all this data, we're comparing ourselves to other communities. You know, um, I'm sure you all can see this. But there is a, a wide, there's a, there's a large number of Sunbelt communities, okay? So there's a lot of folks that are be going to be moving, you know, someplace warm. Okay, that, and that's the importance of measuring in, you know, context and measuring in comparison. Right, and, and that's um, why, yeah, that's why I asked the question is to, it's good to know why these statistics might be low. Scott, Scott Brown, who is uh, the chief economist, and you ever hear him speak, he'll say I'm the only economist, which is why I'm the chief at Raymond James uh, Financial. <laughs> He says, um, you know, it's kind of like how I'm the research department at the partnership. Uh, but he, he, um, he had heard a statistic. We had not been able to find it. And I know that many uh, of, of the elected officials in the audience are outside of their transportation duties, uh, you know, working to address this problem. Um, but, you know, that group that's sitting on the sidelines, he, you know, Again, not confirmed, but he's Dr. Scott Brown, and I'm just Mr. Dave Sobush. Um, he said that Florida's labor force participation uh, among males of working age, the ones that are sitting out, half of them are on disability, and half of them are on some sort of, um, you know, pain-killing medicine. So it gets back to the opioid crisis, which is something that bubbled up in our stakeholder interviews as well. Um, just two follow-up quick things: uh, is 
What is the percentage of retirees in Tampa Bay compared to those other states? Do we know that? Well, we, know we could find that out. It's not problem. something that we measure, but that's why we took a look at not 25 to 64, not the population. I mean, that's why we took a look at 25 to 64. Okay, and again, we've got a wide array of Sunbelt communities. So we purposely, in that labor force participation, try to extract um, the uh, the retiree or the you know likely retiree. Um, but one thing that you know we know when there is a, uh, a strong uh, group of retirees within a community, um, you know they provide you know some net worth, you know, um, and Tampa Bay performs rather well in terms of net worth per household. Sarasota Manatee performs highest among the four communities or the four metropolitan areas within Tampa Bay. Um, you know they're not working, so wage income is rather low. They generally will support more of a service-based economy. So we do track also the wages of service workers within the community. And in those regards, Tampa Bay moves up a little bit uh, relatively. So um, there is some evidence in these numbers that the retiree population is benefiting service workers within. And, and they would probably bring the income down because if they own their house Well, they house definitely bring cars, the income down. Like um, they don't need it. Well, they, and especially the wage income, you know. Commissioner Kelly. Thank you. Um, this was excellent. It's the second time I've seen it, and I want to see it about five more times. Okay. I, uh, I observe, uh, you know. You're um, going to see it next Wednesday. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's really great. I know it's an abbreviated version too, but um, I love the other the other part of it too. By yeah. the way, um, but I'm wondering about the 14 uh, number 14, the new millennials. Um, is that a like? Because we have apparently a big out migration, also millennials with STEM degrees. So is that a, well, a net, or is that we don't we don't know that everybody that's getting a STEM degree is a millennial. Um, well, that's true too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I want this is a an in migration figure. It was too unwieldy um, to to break the data down and have statistically valid you know, right. results. But we did want to focus on how attractive because we hear a lot of. Um, Frankly, to use a technical term, y'all talking about attracting millennials to the to the market, right? Um, and so we we felt you know as long as this was a statistically valid measure, we could you know put it in. And and the beauty of doing it in comparison is you're comparing the same thing to other areas. Um, yes. And, and I know you're focused on the region as a region. Uh, I did notice when you put the first um, communities up there. Um, that when you when you listed all the communities you were studying, you actually name places. And uh, the only other place that is kind of regional to me is um, South Florida and then Tampa Bay. So I wonder too, in terms of, do you have this broken down statistically by county? Yes, that's a, that's a good question. It'd be a great question if I had a slide for it, um, but I, it's a good question because I have an answer for it. And um, when you visit the website regionalcompetitiveness.org and you, you know, scroll down, you'll see each of these metrics where available and appropriate, uh, because sometimes for statistical validity, we can't break it down very far, but we present it for the four MSAs and the eight counties of the Tampa Bay region. So I can imagine they have very different pictures. And as, um, when, as a commissioner in Hillsborough County, I want to be looking at that yeah. to look at what where, and, what I have to address, which might be very different than I'm yeah. Looking and, at. and the most important part is, you know, we want this to be, you know, on the shelf and not, uh, I mean, on the desk, not on the shelf. Um, and providing the data broken down that way, if if it assists the community in achieving their goals, uh, we were happy to do that. So you'll see all that information at the. Um, at the regionalcompetitiveness.org website. Um, I'll say that Rally Durham is also two separate oh, MSAs that, yeah. that we combine into one. South Florida is one MSA. They have a strong enough commuting pattern where I think in the last you know release of uh, definitions they did combine that into one MSA. We may after the 2020 census and when OMB goes through that process again find that you know some of our counties exhibit stronger you know growth patterns. Uh, between uh, each other, and we might see some of our, uh, you know, communities go through that process as well. Yes, Commissioner. I noticed a lot of focus on the millennials from 25 to 34, and it'd be interesting to dissect into it what makes the ones that are getting graduate degrees here that are leaving, right. and what's bringing the other ones coming in. So that brings me to another one of my favorite adages, uh, which some have said, Dave, that's tap dancing, but it's really not. Uh, good research sometimes asks more questions than it answers. 
And so, um, you know, we are, um, you know, the partnership as a public policy and advocacy organization, um, we dove into to transit and transportation initially. Um, our Council of Governors wanted to await the results of this report to understand where we might focus our attentions next. Uh, we are convening uh, over the next year a, uh, a working group of our investors uh, led by Troy Taylor uh, of Coca-Cola Beverages Florida um, you know, to answer questions just like that. And we will be commissioning, just as we did with transportation, we'll be commissioning white papers, we'll be publishing additional research that seeks to answer some of these questions, you know. Um, you know, every community, you know, talks about a brain drain, but, you know, nobody says, hey, we love all these people coming here. Um, so they're, they're going somewhere, something is happening to them. Um, um, and so I, I look forward over the next year working with my working group and our leadership to help answer, identify, and answer some of those questions and reporting back to the community. I think it's important that we try to find out great what's bringing them here, mm -hmm. or what would, what's making them leave as well, and try to focus. And I think you had a good slide on transit about that. The other thing that I don't see, and you know, we just talked about the baby boomers, mm -hmm. the second largest population that are getting ready to retire, those home values are stable up north, they're looking at where to go. So they're gonna be looking at the whole region in a whole, what can they do when they get there? Yeah. So that, that I think is net worth is critical. I don't mind if it doesn't raise up per capita. I mean, the income level so much, if it's bringing huge net worth. Right. So somehow we gotta so address that. We actually address some of the very outcomes that you ascribe to the baby boomer migration uh, within this report. We talk about the things that make this area attractive to them, the availability of healthcare, housing and transportation affordability. Uh, we also track, you know, the, the, the growth of the value of homes in the area. So a lot of the things that you, you know, say are you know, positive results in attracting baby boomer, we are actually looking at those in this report. And, yeah, there are 60 indicators of economic competitiveness and prosperity. I think I mentioned 15 of them in this report. So there's much more information within this document. For the purposes of these presentations, I, I try to focus on the highlights. I would love to have you come to, as well as our MPO, our regular commission meeting, and maybe even a regional meeting, just to get people to be aware of this great data that you guys are doing. I, I look forward to those invitations. Thank you. Thank you. Just, just, okay, great. Let's look at that. Yes, with. No, I just wanted to thank you, Dave. This is really good context setting for our discussion about regional priorities. We probably need to move on to our public hearing items, but. Thank you very much for being here. Is there maybe one final question? This is all available. Can you give the website again? Yeah. There you go. Regionalcompetitiveness.org. Rolls right off the top. <laughs> <laughs> all, right. all right. Thanks. Thanks, My Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, to keep us moving along, I've asked uh, uh, Councilmember Jim Kennedy to walk us through the public hearing items, but the first item up is, um, is uh, going to be Ray Shermonti and Beth Alden to uh, get started on the public hearing items. And just a reminder, the CCC members are the ones who are voting on these public hearing items. So once again, good morning, everybody, and we'll move to uh, Roman numeral five, uh, number one of the uh, public hearings. And uh, the, one of the things to stress is the CCC board representatives are the only voting members at the table. And with that, let me turn it over to Ray and Beth. Good morning. Uh, again, Beth Alden, the PO director. Uh, Ray Charmonti, yeah. T-Bard, director. Uh, I'll warn you ahead of time, Beth is going to take the majority of the work in this presentation. <laughs> I've been busy with other things and haven't caught up. So um, this is uh, kind of our, our administrative and organizational uh, refresher uh, for the year. And so just a, a quick um, history on um, So uh, who are we? Why are we all here? Uh, the MPO Chairman's Coordinating Committee uh, was actually uh, formed a couple of decades ago back in 1993 and included Hillsborough, Pasco, Pinellas, and Hernando. Um, it was recognized in state law, and then uh, Polk and Sarasota Manatee were added back in 2000. We created an interlocal agreement for regional planning and coordination, which is one of your action items um, this morning with recommending some minor tweaks. Uh, and just some other highlights, uh, we adopted the first regional long-range transportation plan in Florida back in 2004. 
Uh, in 2007, um, the state law created TBARTA, dissolved the Tampa Bay Commuter Rail Authority, and then we proceeded to work with TBARTA on regional planning. So in 2009, the first TBARTA master plan and our second regional long-range transportation plan were drafted in coordination with each other. We spent a lot of time working together. Um, we updated our interlocal agreement in 2014 to actually merge with TBARTA. Uh, and also in 2014, we created the group that focuses on the Hillcrow Pinellas and Pasco TMA, changed our meeting schedule um, from quarterly meetings to two meetings a year, and then started having more frequent meetings at the tri-county level. So that's why we have a little bit of shift in our organizational structure and why we've invited our TMA members here today to uh, engage in that conversation about priorities with the full group. Uh, in 2015, we did produce our first um, consolidated master plan and regional long-range transportation plan with TBARTA and the CCC together uh, as a single document. Um, and so this might all uh, evolve things for uh, it might, might all evolve with TBARTA's new role. And so that's why we're coming to you this morning with some organizational changes. Um, but we do have a, a long history of working together uh, to get major priorities funded. Uh, this is one example. We had a list of major funding priorities back in 2001. And over time, we have gradually kept all of these projects on the radar screen and moved moved all of these forward uh, into construction. The Crosstown Connector, for example, that didn't get funded until the 2009 stimulus package, but it did get funded. So you know, all of these things take time, but working together and sticking to the same message, we can make progress. Um, so our, our current structure um, uh, does include uh, all six uh, MPOs of the eight counties. Um, the policy board of MPO chairpersons is this group that meets twice a year. It is advised by an MPO staff directors committee that meets monthly. And then there are sub working groups that advise that. Um, the T and then the TMA is of course our, our three members. Um, so I'm gonna let Ray talk about the changes to the TBARTA statute in 2017. Okay, very quickly, uh, the name changed of the organization to Transit Authority. Yeah. The number of counties was reduced to five, Fernando, Hillsboro, Manatee, Pasco, and Pinellas. Uh, we have one commissioner from the member counties, four gubernatorial appointees, and then uh, the mayor of the city of Tampa and the mayor of St. Petersburg, and then one board member, this is new, added for PSDA and Hart. A uh, new requirement, rather than a master plan for the whole region, is to produce a regional transit development plan for the five counties, not just the three, but the five counties. This, in my opinion, should be based on the FDOT Hart Premium Transit Study, which will identify what the first project and then build out from that with a 10-year plan uh, showing how that can be implemented with TBART as the implementing agency and how that can be expanded out to the other counties. Thanks. So I well, would suggest to you that even though there are changes in TBART's mission and also the area that it serves, that it is worthwhile for us to continue our partnership with TBARTA for several reasons. And one is that we worked together in the past on a, a single plan for the region. It helps for us to have a single point of contact and point of administrative records uh, and to have a spokesperson for regional transportation priorities. So if somebody's looking for, who do I call to find out what your region's priorities are? There is somebody who can answer the phone and say, these are what the priorities are. Here's the website where you can find those priorities. Before we worked with TBARTA to be that point person and that records keeper, we were rotating that responsibility among all of the MPOs. And it meant that it was a lot more challenging to make sure that that was seamless, that all of the records stayed the same. When we had staff turnover, it was, it was difficult to keep, keep everything running the same, the same direction. Um, 
Also, uh, Dave alluded to after the next census, we might see further growth and consolidation of the urbanized areas. And so this, this is a snapshot of where we are right now. The urbanized area for Tampa Bay is right next to Lakeland, it's right next to Spring Hill, uh, and so there might may very well be changes after the next census. There are also opportunities for us to be cost effective with our dollars, our planning dollars, by working together. The MPOs all set aside a portion of our budgets for regional planning. Um, working together and working with TBARTA, we can make those dollars count. And there have been many TBARTA activities sponsored by uh, MPOs. And then finally, working together, we're winning state funding. Uh, the example of the Coalition for Sun Trail funding was, was I thought, very fruitful last year. So the proposed changes to our interlocal agreement that we'd like to bring to you today would be uh, simply to reflect the name change of the Tampa Bay Area Regional Transit Authority rather than transportation. Uh, and also reflect the change in name for the Pinellas MPO. Uh, and we have a, an additional whereas statement uh, clarifying the more recent history of the changes. So this would be basically continuing the process that we have today. It will open the door for us moving forward to continue our planning collaboration. Now that TBARDA will be responsible for a regional transit development plan, that means that it may fall more heavily on the MPOs to be responsible for the regional long-range transportation plan. But I think certainly we want to be producing those, those planning documents in partnership and bringing them as close together as possible. Questions on the recommended changes? Okay, when, from a voting point of view, let me ask the... Uh, CCC members that are voting to just raise their name tag and then we'll open it up to discussion before looking for a motion. Any discussion or questions relating to the proposal? Is there a motion from a voting member? So moved. Second. Okay, we have a few motions and a few seconds. <laughs> uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Ray. Uh, that moves us to item two on the agenda, um, which is the 2018 Tabata MPO CCC Regional Transportation Priority Projects. And for 2A, we have uh, Mr. Hutchinson. Thank you. I also have a brief presentation. Um, and a lot of the projects that you're going to see in Oh, and this part of the presentation are, they should look pretty familiar because these are the, is it the arrows? Yeah. No, no um, that, that you um, adopted as the um, regional priority projects, i.e. top 10 and a uh, second tier of future regional projects that were adopted um, approximately one year ago. And there is a process that is used to develop these priorities so that all of the projects on these lists do meet certain criteria and um, thresholds for regional significance. Uh, the list that you'll see for the top 10 includes the I-75, 275 State Road 60 Memorial Interchange, State Road 54 and 56 Corridor Improvements, Gateway Express Project, Howard Franklin Bridge Project, Suncoast Parkway 2, um, Tampa Bay Express Starter Projects, the West Shore Multimodal Center and Connections to Downtown Tampa and the Airport, the DeSoto Bridge Replacement in Manatee County, and the River Road Regional Interstate Connector in Sarasota County. These projects are all projects that are not fully funded, but are, are in need of funding. That's why they're on the priority list. And the uh, second tier projects, I will not read all of these, but these also include a 
um, regionally significant projects throughout the T-Barta region. Um, some of these projects are slated to receive some funding or have received some funding. So they're in various stages and as you adopt the next uh, iteration of your priorities, you may wish to um, uh, incorporate language that allows staff to update the descriptions of the projects to reflect the latest um, status as the F. Work program takes effect uh, come July, because there there has, is funding slated to go on some of these projects. So that's what I have. If you have questions about specific projects, we have people here who can probably answer them. Any questions or comments at this time for Mr. Hutchison? Anyone? Um, have you guys compared to what the TMA has approved for their top priority projects? Have you looked at that? Because I don't see one voice from the two agencies because they seem to be completely different. Um, as far as the transit projects? The uh, uh, top priority projects, yeah. Should be happening. I mean, the, the, the proposed projects for 2018 um, should, the, the draft that you're going to see in a few minutes should reflect the um, effort that has been done at the TMA, right. gonna, that, that, which is fairly That's amazing. a great point. That's exactly uh, what we're going to be talking about next. Okay. So there'll be item, item 2D, yep. I think. We're just ahead of your time as I always. Didn't, I knew it was like two or three. <laughs> <laughs> great question. Great. Any other questions or comments at this time? Otherwise, we'll move to B, which is FDOT District 7 Tentative Work Program. And who do we have from FDOT? Uh, fortunately, it's me. Short <laughs> <laughs> <Sure>, Robert. <clears throat> All right, good morning. I'm Ed McKinney. I'm the uh, Planning and Environmental Administrator for the uh, District 7 DOT office. I'm going to go through this real quickly. Uh, many of you have seen this through uh, uh, NPO meetings, board meetings that we've attended, so you're not going to be surprised here today with anything uh, new, but uh, we'll go through it. So we're going to go over an overview of the process, kind of show you what the program is, that's why you're here, and also kind of go a little bit about some District 7 major projects that might be of interest on a regional basis, kind of uh, call those out and uh, for you as well. Um, and you know, it's a, you know, the DOT work program is a five-year work revolving program. One year drops off, another year gets added. Um, it includes all modes, uh, transit, seaport, airport, rail projects, as well as uh, ro uh, road projects. Uh, this program runs uh, July 2018. This is a tentative program until it's adopted by the Florida legislature and approved by the governor. Uh, normally that happens around, it becomes effective in July, as you know and it'll run through, this This program runs through June 30th of 2019. Uh, um, well, the fiscal year 2019 runs through 2019. Uh, it includes all DOT projects uh, and any local project if there's DOT funding that's uh, uh, involved in that. Basically, this is part of the governor's budget. So just to kind of walk you through, and, and I apologize if, this, if, this, if you've heard this, but many people sometimes ask how, a, how, a pro, how what's the project development cycle process. And, and as many of you know, it actually, the, the planning process is probably the most critical, pivotal part of this whole thing because that identifies the need. That's where we identify our congestion, that's where we identify our safety issues, our, our lack of uh, investment in multimodal uh, uh, investments. So in the, the planning process is one of the more critical parts of this, of this whole process because this is where we're collecting data, and this is where we could have the most wide open conversation about solutions and possible solutions. Um, so um, I stress that important is because it's important that, that we all encourage folks to participate in this planning process, because we can talk about some crazy ideas here. We can talk about maglev vehicles, we can talk about underground tunnels. All of those things could be discussed and analyzed during the planning process. 
But as we evolve, as, as we graduate from that into the project development, the environmental process, that's when you start, you're developing alternatives, you've, you've, you've solidified, uh, you've identified what the need is, and now you're on your way to solutions. And so that's the design. You start acquiring right away and ultimately going to construction, you start maintaining, and then it begins all over again. Actually, it's, it, you, before you even get to construction, you've already probably over exceeded the capacity of what you're going to build. So uh, probably the planning process begins even before construction is complete. So I'm going to kind of skip over this and kind of go into the projects. Uh, um, so we're going to talk about uh, some new projects that weren't currently in the program, some additional phases that we've added. Uh, we'll start with Hillsborough County. Um, we've got I-4 east of I-75 to east of Williams Road some operational improvements, add some auxiliary lanes. Uh, we've advanced construction from 21 to 2018. Uh, on I-275 from south of Kennedy Boulevard to south of Lois, again, some operational improvements. These are going to dovetail nicely into the Howard Franklin Bridge uh, reconstruction that we'll, we're going to be doing. Again, adding some additional capacity throughput, try to remove that choke point that, as you're coming off the bridge into the West Shore area. Uh, 41, uh, Pendola Point to uh, South Causeway Boulevard. Commissioner Kemp, this is one of your projects that you know we're going to be looking at making improvements in that area, maybe fly over some type of bypass system to improve that uh, congestion uh, that's currently occurring there. Um, uh, some projects uh, that were dropped on 255 South of Willow to, um, excuse me, South of Lois to Willow Avenue, Interstate Modification Section 5. Basically, we've removed the construction. Uh, from some of our old TVX projects as we're, as we're moving this TV next conversation forward. Um, we, we didn't want to, to, to send a message to the public that we've made up our mind. So the TV next conversation is still ongoing. Uh, we expect at some point as, the, as we begin to develop that plan, project funding will come back in and we'll begin that process again once we've identified uh, what it is we're going to construct. But there's still a tremendous amount of public outreach that, that we're going to be doing, particularly this upcoming year. And I-4 um, from the uh, Selman Connector to east of Branch Forbes Interstate uh, moder Modification, which is our sec Section 8 of, uh, of TV Next, uh, we've added right away in 2019. Again, that's in anticipation of, of some future project because we know there's going to be some needs out there. Um, intermodal uh, projects, uh, uh, big band channel improvements at, uh, at Port of Tampa, seaport capacity in 2019, Hooker's Point improvement at Port of Tampa Bay. Um, again, some these are projects that we that we work with the with the port um, and to get those added. Um, we're also heavily invested in transit. Um, you know, we, we we provide a lot of funding, and I'll, I won't go through all of these projects uh, with you, but we do participate in bus replacement program. Um, and we're also participating in, in a site improvements at the Marine Tran, uh, Transfer Station. Uh, we've added some funding there. Uh, in Pinellas County, uh, uh, in Gandy Boulevard, 4th Street out uh, to West Shore Boulevard, we're gonna reconstruct some frontage roads. Uh, that we're looking at the Gandy, uh, Gandy Bridge Trail. This is a pd &E that will start in 2020. Uh, we've got uh, funding for the PE in 2021. We've been asked by both Hillsboro and Pinellas to look at more trail connectivity. Um, you'll see also that we've added that connectivity, not just in the Gandy area, but we're looking at it on the Howard Franklin Bridge as well. I-275 uh, from 54th Avenue South to Gandy Boulevard. Again, uh, that's the lane continuity, meeting with the Pinellas uh, MPO folks. They've asked us to, to, to look at that. We're gonna be looking at lane continuity as well as uh, the feasibility of express lanes that will be able to go, go through that area. So we've added PE in uh, some other projects real quick, US-19 from South Timberland, South Lake, add lanes, reconstruct, we've added some right-of-way funding in 23 um, uh, from 66th Avenue to 118th, uh, construction is funded in, also in 23, and from 580 to North Drive Drive, uh, we deferred construction uh, from 20 to 21. And just uh, additional uh, alternate US-19 projects, we've added PE and 2023, um, and we're going to be advancing some survey. We're working with the <coughs> county now uh, on alternate 19. I believe there was a meeting here recently where we're, we're studying all various alternatives, and we're excited about getting that moving forward. And 
So again, I'm, I'm kind of going a little slow. I'll try to speed up. Uh, Pasco County projects, uh, ITS. This is something that, that, that the District 7 is going to be looking at a lot more heavily. As, as we're getting more constrained in our ability to, to widen roads, we're looking at various alternatives to, to solving our congestion needs. And one of these areas is in the intelligent transportation area. So we're, we're excited about a lot of initiatives we're, we've got going on. And, and these are the type of projects that that we, we see as we move forward, us, us doing a lot more of, whether it's ATMS, um, advanced adaptive signal controls, um, using technology to help us solve some of the congestion problems that we have. Um, but um, we're also uh, 52 from East 41 to uh, State Road, uh, well, Bellamy Brothers, uh, we've added right away in 23, and at 54 or 41, we've added right away in 2023, and this is uh, on working with Pasco County as they continue uh, having discussions uh, with their residents there. So um, interchange improvements uh, on I-75, I-275 from South County Line to County Line Road. We've added PD&E there. Um, I-75, I-275 from County Line Road to 56. Uh, uh, interchange improvements there, we've added right away. Um, uh, 301. Um, you know what, I'm gonna kind of go through these real quickly. So we've added some right away funding on 301 uh, and, and also on Pasco County. And uh, on 54, we've added construction uh, both on uh, from Western Chapel Boulevard uh, to North Magnolia Boulevard and also at 41 uh, as well. Uh, this was a project that kind of, that the one I just, I just kind of went through real quick. Uh, things only goes in one direction. All right, so let me let me skip to Hernando uh, real quick. Uh, State Road 50, Cortez uh, uh, from Cobb to uh, Buckhop Road, added construction in 23. Um, also on State Road 50 from uh, the other side of that from Buckhop Road to West Jefferson, right away in construction was added. Uh, State Road 50 from 301 Suffolk County Line, we added some advanced acquisition in 98. Um, and, and, uh, we have added a new roundabout uh, there with PE added in 20, construction in 22. And then some bike pedestrian on Good Neighbor Trail uh, right away was added in 2019 and construction in 22. Uh, Citrus County uh, with Wacucci Dun Allen Trail Connector. Uh, multi, uh, we've added construction in 2019 that fully funds that construction. And on 19, uh, from Fernando uh, County line out to west of Green Acre Street, uh, we've added a bike path uh, trail right away was added in 2019. Uh, some roadway projects in Citrus County, 41. Uh, we've added some right of way in 19 and 22 with construction in 23 and 41. Uh, from Arlington from to north of uh, State Road 200, we, we're adding, uh, we're gonna widen that from two to four lanes and we've added right of way advanced acquisition in 2021. Uh, transit, uh, we've got the Tampa Regional Transit Study. This is kind of exciting. Uh, this, is, this is the next phase of that Regional Transit Study. Um, we're, we've got the pd and &E funded for that, which is the project development. As I said right now, the, you know, as I was showing you in the beginning, that life cycle process, the regional transit feasibility plan is part of that planning process. This takes it to that next step. It's gonna require some commitments and, and from, from a regional, and you know, from, a, from, from regional bodies on, on how we're gonna pay for it moving forward. That's part of the process of getting into the FTA process and, and moving this project forward. Uh, but, but DOT stands ready to move this project forward and we're, we've, we've funded the next phase of that study. Um, just real quick, I'm gonna kind of highlight uh, some things. Just a reminder, uh, we are still going through the Supplemental Environmental EIS uh, process on the, uh, on the segment from West Shore out to the, uh, just past the Selman Connector and north to the MLK, that process is ongoing. Uh, we will be doing uh, extensive public outreach over the next year. Um, and then as we, we hope to have a, an alternative identified by the end of 2018, 2019, at least be able to start narrowing down those concepts of what we're going to be moving on. I mentioned the operational improvements we'll be making on I-275 State Road 60. This will help alleviate some of the bottlenecks that exist in that area in advance of the, of the Howard Franklin Bridge construction. Uh, you know, these are some transit, the fees that are identified there are those, tra those uh, transit area, uh, uh, multimodal centers that we're gonna be looking at for transit connectivity. 
Uh, as this regional transit conversation continues, we also have to address the last mile, first mile transit connectivity. So we're going to be looking at, at those things as well. Uh, I mentioned that we're going to be studying uh, uh, express lanes all the way into looking express lanes into the downtown St. Pete area. So we would have, com we would have a complete express lane, uh, possibly an express lane system running all, all the way from from just uh, from around Branch Forbes and Hillsborough County all the way up possibly to downtown St. Petersburg. Um, Howard Franklin Bridge, I think you've all seen this. Uh, that project's funded in, uh, um, and, and the bridge replacement in 2019. We'll be getting to begin in that process. We just had the last public hearing a couple weeks ago and we're <coughs> moving forward with uh, getting that document approved. So that's advancing nicely. And, and then the Gateway Express uh, will be going under construction, uh, should be under construction, uh, probably this month, I think, or, or some, they're doing some work out there now. Expect to be completed in 2021. Um, I-75 I corridor, so this is an expansion of a little bit. We had an original pd &E study basically going from the Fletcher area down to Moccasin Wallet. Uh, we're gonna expand that, looking at taking that up to possibly uh, State Route 52 in Pasco County. <coughs> Uh, with, the, with the work that Pasco County is doing and the development that's occurring in that area, we see that you know, this is a good time for us to look at you know, how would express lanes make sense you know, um, extending through that area. As we look at move, shifting the express lanes off I-275 over to I-75, this is going to become a vital corridor for, uh, for, for moving people and goods in our region. So uh, we look forward to working with all our partners and we're excited about uh, uh, the challenges we have ahead of us. Uh, so if you have any questions. Questions or comments for Mr. McKinney? Okay, well I'll say thank you for the, uh, the dandy from, uh, we're one stoplight away from being able to go from the Skyway to I-4 by Gandy. So uh, thank you for that. And we'll move to FDOT District 1 Tenant of Work Program. Good morning. I'll try to speak loud then. I don't think the microphone's on. Uh, good morning. Laura Hersher with District 1. Uh, we have a video for you this morning that highlights projects um, as prioritized by the Sarasota Manatee and Polk MPO TPOs. Um, what we've done is each year we produce a video, especially for each of our MPOs and TPOs in the district. So we've tried to marry those projects, or the video highlighting those projects together here. And I'll just note for you that uh, the full reports for each county on what we have in our tentative um, proposed work program are available on the district's website, as well as a interactive map that helps you search projects by area and by roadway and uh, provide you the information about what's programmed and what year what phase and, and how much money. And that is at the SWFL Roads, South Florida Roads.com. So, or Southwest Florida Roads.com, sorry. So I'm gonna let you look at the video and then I'll be available for questions if you have any. Hello, I'm Mel K. Nando, District Secretary of Florida of the Transformation District One. Our mission is to provide a safe transportation system that ensures the mobility of people and goods, enhances economic prosperity, and preserves the quality of our environment and communities. In a moment, you will view a brief presentation about how the work program is developed and the types of projects for which FDOT is responsible. Florida Department of Transportation staff at District 1 continually work with our other transportation partners, including local, state, and regional governments, and agencies, counties, cities, as well as our port, airport, and transit providers to identify and develop priority projects. We plan the future of our transportation corridors to meet the growing mobility demand for people and freight, and also to provide solutions and alternative options for existing congested corridors. We strive to maintain our transportation system at levels our residents, businesses, and visitors are accustomed to and expect. Additionally, development of the work program is also guided by two strategic documents, the Florida Transportation Plan and the Strategic Intermodal System Plan. 
both of which focus on Florida's future transportation network by preserving existing infrastructure and improving transportation choices, which contribute to Florida's economic competitiveness. The tentative five-year work program for fiscal years 2019 through 2023 requires an update to projects already programmed in the first four years before new projects can be scheduled for the new fifth year. Projects in the work program include highway, bridge, aviation, seaport, rail, transit, multi-use trail, sidewalk, and bicycle facilities. FDOT is also at the forefront of automated vehicles and are preparing our roadways to be as efficient and safe as possible for the age of driverless cars. Speaking of technology, FDOT uses advanced equipment and tools to monitor and assist with improving traffic congestion, traffic signals to provide real-time information to our road users, and improve the movement of freight and goods. The work program process is complete each year once Florida's legislature approves a tentative work program in the spring, and it is adopted by the State Secretary of Transportation by July 1st. Funding for these projects comes from federal, state, and local sources such as taxes, fees, and tolls. Funds are then allocated to each of FDOT's seven districts per legislative requirements based on population amounts, funds collected, and safety and needs assessments. Tolls collected by a given agency stay within that agency. In the next five years, District 1 anticipates an investment of over $2.8 billion on our transportation system. Projects in the work program meet Florida's priorities of safety, preservation, and maintenance, and we have delivered. Recently, the district opened the Interstate 75 at University Parkway Interchange in Sarasota, which drastically improved congestion at the exit. This interchange, known as our Diverging Diamond Interchange, is the largest of its kind in the country and first in Florida. FDOT continues to offer innovative solutions to address our state's transportation demands. Continuing on our successes, Hope County. FDOT is planning on constructing a new rail bridge over I-4, a new interchange at State Road 557 at I-4, widening U.S. 27 in Lake Wales, and resurfacing State Road 60 in eastern Polk County, and includes designing or building multi-use paths in Polk City, Haines City, and Lakeland. We are widening dozens of miles of roadways, installing miles of bike lanes and sidewalks, and improving intersections. The work program also funds FDOT's planning for our future by providing for studies like the Lakeland Area Alternatives Analysis which is looking at ways to improve all modes of transportation for safety, mobility, quality of life, and economic development within the study area. Or the old Dixie Trail Planning Study, looking for corridors for a future multi-use trail connecting Auburndale to Haines City. We are improving safety while balancing the needs of all road users by introducing the Complete Streets concept, which will help us provide more context-based roads by putting the right street in the right place such as Wabash Avenue in Lakeland. Additionally, the turnpike continues to improve the Polk Parkway by widening and resurfacing portions of the roadway. With Manatee and Sarasota counties, FDOT is scheduling new I-75 interchanges at US 301, Fruitville Road, Clark Road, and Bee Ridge Road and widening the Venice Bypass and State Road 70 from Lorraine Road to Waterbury Road. The work program also funds FDOT's planning for our future by providing for studies like the Barrier Islands Study, which is looking at ways to improve transportation on the Barrier Islands of Manatee and Sarasota counties. We have also been implementing modern roundabouts, which have been proven across the United States to reduce crashes, save lives, and slow traffic, among other community benefits, and are designing more like those at US 41 and Royal Street and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Way in Sarasota. Thank you again for your interest in the FDOT District 1 and Florida Turnpike Enterprise Canada Five Year Work Program for fiscal years 2019 through 2023. And please be safe on Florida's roads. Thank you. Questions or comments for Ms. Hutcher? Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Well, we're I, we noticed uh, in the draft tentative work program some funding for some of the priorities that have been adopted by the MPO, supported by the CCC and TBARDA, and that um, we think that this whole regional um, collaboration and coordination process is really working. Thank you. I'd just add, um, because the video was um, created before uh, we had really fine-tuned everything that was going to go into the tentative program. Uh, 
district's also looking at some interstate master plans on I-75 through the Sarasota Manatee area, as well as farther south in Lee and Collier, and then also in I-4 in Polk County. So we'll be working closely with District 7 on those two areas that um, you know, we'll be matching up there on I-4 and 75. Any other questions or comments? Thank you for your presentation. And we'll move to uh, 2D, uh, what makes a project a priority? And we have Mr. Johnny Wong. Hi everyone, Johnny Wong, Hillsborough MPO. I'm gonna provide you with some background info on what constitutes a priority project and briefly describe the evaluation criteria used by both the CCC and then the TMA. Um, to begin with, I borrowed this slide from Beth. She is my director, so I knew that this slide would be perfect. Um, I really like this org chart because I think it very clearly distinguish, or it very clearly shows that the TMA is part and parcel of the CCC. And one of our colleagues uses the term, uh, well, he evokes the term of a Russian nesting doll to describe how projects can kind of funnel up the pipeline seamlessly. Um, so the priorities of each MPO filter up to the TMA and from the TMA to the CCC. This has oftentimes been the case, but not always because the CCC and the TMA have different evaluation criteria that they use to vet projects. The majority of, the, well, the major projects of the CCC uh, originate from the FDOT Strategic Intermodal System Plan, the TBARTA Master Plan, from the MPO LRTPs. But the CCC evaluation criteria are very limited, whereas the TMA are a little bit more robust. So the three questions that the CCC uses to vet projects are, is the project regional? Can it be implemented soon? And does it have support in the form of an agency action, a resolution, or a state agreement or a state commitment? Um, the CCC at any given time has between six and 10 priority projects on its list. The TMA, on the other hand, maintains a list of five priority projects. Um, they use a more technical vetting process. It doesn't result in a ranking scheme, but the technical criteria are used to help the leadership group understand the benefits of each project. Um, for example, they may be unfamiliar or less familiar with some of the projects that are um, applicable to the other MPOs, and so this is just used as an educational tool. TMA evaluation process begins with three screening questions which are similar to the CCC criteria, but then go on to include a more technical portion. I've included this for you. Um, I'm sure that after this meeting, the Matanti will send slides. Um, but as you can see, the technical criteria are a little bit more robust. And based on the existing criteria, <coughs> small working group, very small working group, uh, we held a brainstorming session to review the criteria and see if we could add any additional to make <coughs> the uh, vetting process a little bit more complete. Um, I believe that the next presenter is going to get a little bit more into the weeds on that, but some of the future considerations that we kicked around were adding criteria which reward projects which advance efforts to achieve MAP 21 performance targets. So we want to give bonus points to any project that will improve safety improve truck, uh, truck travel time reliability, improve um, congestion on the highways, and improve pavement and bridge condition. We also kicked around the idea of adding or refining the existing criteria, which reward projects that connect numerous activity centers. The criteria that exists in the TMA list right now rewards a point to a project that connects two activity centers, we think that if you're connecting more than two, um, that might be a project that deserves a little bit of a higher rating. And lastly, we also suggest rewarding projects which make multiple modes of travel. Uh, we really came at this criteria from the perspective of the TVX process. So we know that since the TVX plan was rolled out, FDOT has gone back and added um, through lanes that have the capability to um, host AVPRT and also on Howard Franklin Bridge, a pedestrian bike trail. And so we think that that kind of effort deserves extra points. And if there are any questions, take them now. Questions or comments? All right, 
All right, thank you. Thank you. And we'll move to E, proposed changes to the 2018 regional priority project list. And we have uh, Howard Pinellas, Executive Director with Blanton. Okay, so this is really where we build on the presentations that you've already seen. And what I'm going to do is just walk you through where the changes are. Um, but first I wanted to talk about uh, what's on our party list that we've gotten funding for. And so uh, the Howard Franklin Bridge rebuild, the Suncoast Parkway 2, uh, the extension to State Road 44, and then the Gateway Express in Pinellas County. These are projects that will remain on the list because they've been funded, but they haven't been completed yet. Um, so we're pleased to see that progress. In addition to that, uh, we have projects that are on the list that will remain on the list because they're not fully funded. Uh, State Road 54, 56 quarter improvements. There's some funding, but not complete funding for that quarter. The DeSoto Bridge replacement uh, in Manatee County, uh, north-south connection across the Manatee River. The River Road Regional Interstate Corridor in southern Sarasota County remains on the list. <coughs> and then uh, let's talk about some of the additions. And this is where the alignment happens with the TMA leadership group uh, for the three counties. Uh, as well as what's being advanced in the other MPO areas outside of the TMA. So uh, regional transit catalyst projects that are coming out of the uh, Tampa Bay uh, Regional Transit Feasibility Plan, uh, as well as uh, the Central Avenue <coughs> Transit Project in Pinellas County, which has been advanced uh, to the Federal Transit Administration for, for new, uh, small starts funding. So in this, we have the West Shore Intermodal Center, or Multimodal Center, uh, we have regional express bus network projects, and you can see uh, State Road 60, Gulf to Bay, Veterans Expressway, Suncoast Parkway, Gandhi, and, and State Road 54, 56, and anything that comes out of the Tampa Bay next. And these are uh, future regional express bus projects that may take advantage of express toll lanes, uh, interstate corridors, and other toll facilities. The Tampa Bay Premium Transit Feasibility Plan implementation uh, catalyst project. Uh, again, we will have a meeting in January at the TMA leadership group to really talk about the phasing and costing of those components. And within that, uh, you may remember the vision map uh, that went along with that. Uh, so we have things like the CSX rail corridor and waterborne transportation projects such as the Cross Bay Ferry, which are incorporated into the Tampa Bay Premium Transit Feasibility Plan implementation. Uh, in addition, we have elevated transit within the State Road 60 corridor as a placeholder for what technology may ever eventually emerge uh, in that corridor as well. And then the regional shared use uh, non-motorized trail network or SunRail uh, Sun Trail network is also a 2018 addition, and that captures a number of trail connections. The Coast to Coast Trail connection is nearing completion, but there are still a few gaps that remain. Florida's Gulf Coast Trail uh, down to the Naples Collier County area, uh, the Peace River to Nature Coast Trail, and the local connections to regional and statewide network. And then Polk County, the Bartow Northern Connection uh, Phase 2 is a 2018 addition. You can see that in red there. And the T. Barta Regional Transit Development Plan. This is a uh, a little bit different animal it is a plan as opposed to a, a specific project, but because T. Barta is talking to the legislature about getting funding for the regional TVP, we felt it was important to add this to the list as well. So I'll see if there are any questions about this, uh, but before I do that, I wanted to give you a heads up of what may be coming next. These are projects that are in the planning phase uh, and may be moving into a future regional transportation priority. 15th Street East Corridor in Manatee and Sarasota County, State Road 50 improvements in Orlando, <coughs> US 41 multimodal improvements in Manatee and Sarasota, the Tampa Streetcar extension and modernization, which is underway, and the I-275 and Selma Expressway limited access highway connection. Uh, this is the to close the gap uh, that Mr. Kennedy uh, talked about in terms of one remaining traffic signal. Uh, and there's some timing issues with that project as well to get the Gateway Express and I-275 construction advanced first. But we'll be revisiting these in future years to bring them to the list. So I'll go back to these additions and see if anybody has any questions about them. 
And we, before we go into the uh, roundtable discussion and action on priorities, let me ask if there's any public comment. Okay, not seeing any. We'll uh, request one. Question. One question, sir. Is it possible that we can consolidate some of these lists that are liked and, or linked as we go along? Uh, I'm sh we've done that in the past. I'm sure we can continue to do that. Do you have a specific example of what you would like to see consolidated? Like what you just, just showed on, on the um, 15 um, catalyst projects. That's a good example. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're, we they're sort of integrated into a, a, a single app. It would work. We can work on doing that. I don't know if uh, any of my MPO counterparts have any comments on that. Uh, we, we also group the interstate uh, projects together as interstate modernization. And we have the, you know, the top 10 and then we have the, the second tier, but it seems like um, with some of them advancing, there might be opportunities to, um, or benefit to consolidating and having one list of priorities that's concise and grouped. Like, And let me flip back to the public comment and just uh, for the record there's no public comment so we'll close the public comment and let's continue the uh, discussion on the presentation. Any other, Any other questions on the 18 edition? All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know I, I look at the region and what's going to bring us all together and at the TMA we had a long discussion about um, the CSX rail lines. Initially, I thought there was just a line running from Brooksville down to Channel Side. Found out later on this one just close to USF, just below it, running all the way across West Shore, the airport, Shrules, Mar, hitting Clearwater, hitting, clearing St. Pete. When I listened to the presentation by the Tampa Bay Partnership, it seems to me the millennials are going to be looking for a place to go. But I think it's also the baby boomers are going to retire. They want to find out who's got the transit that can actually take care of their accommodations. I think it's the one thing that should be uniting the whole group, and I thought part of the reason coming down it was going to be to talk about that as in, a, in a pretty strong way. Um, so I'd like to hear like uh, what others are thinking as well. Are you familiar with it? Have you seen the CS presentation to the CCCs and the uh, T bar? Do you actually see the same thing? Because to me, if we build that spine first, all these other things that we're looking at could be part of it in a matching grant money with the feds. But you need to have something that's going to tie us all in together to get that first thing. And I, and I think nationally, part of the reason we get so little back from the dollars we put in is we don't have this area, one voice, to talk about one major project that we can all benefit from. And obviously we've had presentations at the TBTMA on that issue. Commissioner Kent? I just want to agree wholeheartedly. Actually, I think one of the reasons we don't get money back is because we don't have any transit system to preserve. And the others get transit system preservation dollars since we don't have a transit system, <laughs> basically. I mean, our transit is, um, so as we saw, we're 20th in transit, um, the, the partnership presentation, 20th out of 20. Um, we're third in commuter and ability to use cars. It's like, it, you know, we have, um, we're doing okay there, but we have failed um, with our transit systems. I, I think the ferries are wonderful low-cost ways of connecting us in, in certain areas. There's no silver bullet, but I, the CSX tracks to me are a natural that they have done in Miami and Orlando. And um, they're, they, I think that there are regional um, opportunity along with the fact that we have water that Austin and Denver and uh, Atlanta don't have. And uh, we could do a ferry system and they're both within um, you know, within our uh, actual um, dollars that we have now, um, I think uh, as counties, uh, with our county countywide dollars and resources, and with the uh, dollars we need to get these projects to move forward. So I just want to wholeheartedly support you for the line that goes from Brooksville to Channel Side, that goes across South Tampa, that goes from Bush Gardens to Clearwater, and Clearwater down to St. Pete. I think it would be a terrible loss. Um, not to at least try to grab that right away for the future, even if there's not rail in the future, that we could run transitways along there. 
So um, I just really want to emphasize that. And thank you so much. Uh, do we have a hot representative or what you want to give us an update as to where that regional premium transit study is? Well, I, and, and to build on the conversation, we did have a very good dialogue at the TMA leadership group meeting uh, back in November about that. And the, the gist of it was when in our January meeting, and I believe January 19th, is that right, for the TMA leadership group meeting, we will have that like a two hour dialogue discussion of phasing cost segmentation and prioritization and based on that we then agreed that we would go around to all the different county commissions and have a unified request on what those key priorities are to get alignment among the different county commissions in our region and the focus there is on the the three uh, core TMA counties of Hillsborough, Pinellas, and Pasco, but the vision extends beyond that. And I think the CSX really does capture that larger, that larger vision, and it's a real underutilized asset in Pinellas County as well. So I think by having it on the list right now, we set ourselves up for refining that list, consolidating where necessary for um, the Sarasota Manatee comment, um, and then really having a more focused ask but we need to wait until we have the full picture on cost and phasing options in that January meeting. So we then talked about really being February and March as the time frame to go out and make those uh, requests and, and presentations to the county commissions. And getting those county commissions is key because that's really where a lot of the local commitment for operating and maintenance is gonna have to emanate from. Yes. The, thank you. Um, the CCC has in the past identified as a as a standalone priority um, the preservation uh, of the freight rail corridor rights of way, and we framed it that way, not identifying the CSX in particular, um, but saying in general freight rail rail rights of way, uh, because I think in the Sarasota Manatee area. There are other corridors besides those owned by CSX. Uh, but I think there are a number of locations where these corridors would be beneficial, um, perhaps for transit, <coughs> maybe for trails, maybe for other uses. Uh, and identifying this as an opportunity that we should not pass up, it seems to me that that might be a worthwhile regional priority and is certainly something that we have supported in the past. I would suggest at the very least we might want to change our terminology here from CSX rail quarter to freight rail quarter, we might want to also consider identifying it as a standalone priority. Dave? Okay. I, I concur with that. I think there is a history of exactly what our commissioner from Pasco County suggested, which is this grand vision and the original formation of T-BARTA was built with that in mind with this developing a spine that would eventually extend north and south and east and um, I, that, I would say that that continues to remain uh, where we all want to head. The getting these premium, premium transit um, uh, and demonstrating the feasibility in order to get some of the federal funds and make the projects feasible um, and showing the local commitment to fund the local portion is probably where we run into issues occasionally. Um, you know, we had a in Sarasota and Manatee, we had bus rapid transit in our long range plan funded. But then as the uh, economy turned south, so to speak, uh, um, we did, did not have that local commitment to, to fund and to dedicate rights away in, in some cases. So there are lots of challenges to getting there, but that's still where we want to get, I believe, based on the policies adopted by our elected officials. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I think that hearing from our partnership today in their competitive uh, connective report, we should all, again, with one voice, as we always say at TMA, um, look at this list as uh, definitely a great addition of 2018. Um, and, and there's, you know, the, the autonomous, the elevated, the waterborne, the rail, freight rail, I like the freight rail idea because not only will we have freight rail corridor, 
we'll have uh, freight corridor, or autonomous freight corridors as well that we're to be considering in the future. So um, I want to just put the shout out there to the partnership and in putting that report together because that gives us the opportunity. It's just another piece of the puzzle that we can take to the state and federal level and to a public-private partnership level to move a lot of the projects forward. So I agree with you, Commissioner. We, you know, we've got to get these projects working quick because the technology is changing so quickly. And and our and the other part of it is with the report from the partnership, we're seeing where the needs are clearly with that report. I encourage everybody to go online. I went on and looked at the uh, the competitive connection.org and go on there the, the actual booklet that presentation today is on there electronically try to go back to everybody out in the community and, and kind of give them the overview of our needs because a lot of people they will come to us and say no we don't need that or no we don't need to we you know we're doing just fine the way we are well us 19 is working now well we, we we're hearing our because of our population growth which is just exploding in every county in this region that you know there's going to be a day that even the beautiful us 19 that you have all these flyover bridges and you don't have to stop that's also starting to become very congested people are trying to find ways around the town to get to where they need to go because one accident on any of our bridges or on us 19 we're, we're, we're stuck so um, I just want to have that said and uh, part of the record to encourage everybody to go out on to um, the partnerships webpage and, and deliver that report to all your your elected officials and, and folks that really care about what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Jack? And I'd like to echo the same sentiment as far as that reaching out as well. I actually did a Facebook post posting out that thing and hopefully that could, everyone does the same type of thing and let people who read it ahead of time before the presentation or at least get the extra input. Um, you know, I, I, I do think the big spine is the, is the great catch and, you know, Pinellas County I think had the most brilliant idea of looking at how they were trying to sell it where so much growth was going to come along that corridor. Um, Hillsborough, I know, has tried to make the effort to, you know, get it to go to when you, between your rural areas and the city to try to make that fly. And I, I'll tell you, from when I looked at the money that we were supposed to get many years ago that went to Raleigh-Durham, uh, that money that they invested was about $536 million to build the rail to connect it to an old freight car to now an industrial line, now a passenger line that connects all their major stuff and they have now generated 1.2 to 1. billion dollars in investment and these are numbers from back five years ago they have made 236 million dollars a year in just extra tax revenue if we looked at a comprehensive tax revenue program i think all the people in the rural areas and that means in my county too in certain areas it won't be affected necessarily but if you could say look the growth is going to pay for itself this is not going to cost the taxpayers much money or you know you can, min you can minimize it with looking at that I think it's something we can all get behind and prop up to make a drive where everybody can get behind it. And I think you have three, all the counties working together that are going to be affected and let it branch out from earth. I think with a united voice go and say, this is what we all believe. This is what we've been working on for so many years. This is the way to get it done. That first step can bring us all together and get all that extra money all around it for all these other projects, which we could say all these other projects are good matching funds that we're going to put to help this survive. And thrive. To add to that, you know, we right now we just approved three more housing areas, having 2,000 <coughs> houses each. And over the last few years, I've been on the board. The number of people in Hernando County who are leaving Hernando County to go to work <coughs> every day has went up all the way through to us like that 44 to 45 percent. 41 and 19 will be overwhelmed. So CX runs right down beside 41. Mm -hmm. Why not use it? So I think because this stuff takes so long to get done, if we wait till we need it, <coughs> then it will be in big trouble. So I think it's good. Idea. I'm hearing that there may be a couple of potential changes to look at modifying CSX rail quarters, look at freight rail quarters region wide, um, and to maybe move that bullet point to be equal. Is that fair? Just one more point about the CSX, just because I think it's an important one. 
and, and I just realized it when we had our TMA presentation the other week, is that I heard, I hear nothing about Oldsmar, which it goes through also, mm -hmm. connecting the two counties. And what I heard the other day was there's 12,000 people living in Oldsmar, but there's 40,000 people that go in there for jobs Right. every day it's become a major job center and yet it doesn't make any maps as a um, future or, or a present or future um, destination and major point which I'm not sure how we do our mappings in terms of that or what factors go into it but when I heard when I saw that and understood that I, I again it just I would like to just point that out as part of the CXX, CSX rail corridor more likes to claim they're the center of the region too. <laughs> Geographically, well, they are. Mm -hmm. Could have a stadium. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, Commissioner, go ahead. Um, I, you know, I just want to say though that, you know, I, I agree. CSX is very, very important, but it's still got to be within the context of a plan. Right. It can't. You can't just go ahead and bold it and let it be on its own because it really needs to be a part of a regional priority plan, which is what the premium transit feasibility plan that DOT is working on. And CSX has a lot to do with DOT. So I think, I, I, I don't know about having it be there on its own, you know, without, you know, being under a planning type of Other questions or comments? And I would just throw in two things kind of other than the CSX that one of the mantras that we continue to hear from FDOT, uh, specifically to Pinellas and Hillsborough, is that we have to come up with a plan before FDOT can come up with mass transit uh, over the Howard Franklin. Um, and for us to come up with a plan, we've got to come up with a funding mechanism for the 25% of construction and the maintenance. And uh, many people in this room have heard me say it, but once again, I think we get to the point where we have to have at least a referendum at the same time on the Pinellas ballot and the Hillsborough ballot so that the citizens can see that we're actually connecting the region. And we're not trying to leave you out, Jack, but I'm just talking about the, Hills, uh, the, the Howard Franklin Bridge and the mass transit in that little section. Unless you want to pay for <laughs> Well, I was going to say. <laughs> well, I mean, in, in, if I could. I mean, and again, thinking bigger, this is, this is like this line goes from Brooksville all the way down. Even if it was a small contribution from Pasco and Hernando, I think it's part of the discussion. And if you're going to say, look, we are starting to link, and our people are going to say, look, they're going to pay a lot more to get started. Once it gets up to us, we'll be going higher. But I think you should be linking us and looking for us to be involved right from the get-go. May I just say, I think we could have a transit system of expressways or, or uh, on, the, on the bridge, because that's what we always seem to be focused on all the time. I mean, there could be traditional bus running on regular basis right now throughout the region. I don't think it with um, limited stops, because you know you do express bus with limited stops. I really think it, um, because it is a regional cross um, you know, it, a bus system on the roads. I really think it should be something that the state should be looking at funding even operations for. Um, and because our paucity of transit funding locally for the things within our uh, local regions, I'm really jealously guard that because our bus system should really, our bus system in Hillsborough County should be at least twice what it is now and probably three times. It would be mediocre if we doubled it. Um, and I think that we need um, those dollars and we need to make our countywide contributions there. But I think we could, if we want, if we had a commitment um, by the state to providing um, some kind of regional uh, inter-county transportation, we could be putting express buses on I-275 um, tomorrow with very little added infrastructure, limited stops, and um, you know, going across the bridge if we're talking about transit between the two counties that could be something that we don't have to you know look down the road for i think one of the problems is if i look around the room and say can a state representative respond to that so other questions or comments i think we're looking for a motion 
With one somebody. question on this before we get to it. When we were looking at this, they all seem to be projects, and then the Tabato seems to be a plan. Is is that the right place for it? Well, I think it's it's an implementation strategy for regional transit, is what the regional transit development plan is supposed to be. Uh, there's a workshop, Ray, if I'm not mistaken, next Friday. Do you want to respond to that? Sure. Um, yes, I think that that's important. The legislature is looking to us, our to commit to producing this plan. That's the only way we're going to get state dollars to help fund regional transit. So that's an important first step. So maybe the argument. And that plan needs to be based on the premium transit. Plan. So maybe the argument could be that the discussion we're having now about CSX or freight corridors or running buses in express lane, it's really Tibarta's responsibility to show how that can be implemented. And that's what this plan would do. But it is un somewhat unprecedented for us to have a planning project along with these physical capital projects. Uh, but they need, they need the money for the plan, and I think you've identified about a million dollars for it. I mean, the reality is if we don't get the money from the legislature, can't do it. We don't have the resources to do that type of planning at the part of under the way we're financing. Yeah, I never did find that funding paragraph in the new legislation. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, there's a, there's a house bill. There's already been a house bill filed for a million dollars to fund doing the plan and beefing up uh, our abilities to do long range planning, which we really don't have a strong component now in our in our funding of the budget. So that's already in the House, and uh, we've been working with uh, Senator Delfano with the Senate and, and uh, Gruders in the House, is, uh, who is sponsoring that bill that was filed on November 14th. Bring it home. Help us. <laughs> um, what, is this a action item for just the CCC members? Just Once again? It's the CCC adoption. Okay, so if we can identify our CCC members and any further discussion. Just a, I'm not a CCC member, but um, to go with that, you know, how does T. Barter work with FTOT, as Commissioner Merman says, trying to, I think you could both of them be jointly working this, right? Yeah. So Absolutely. is that, no, that's the plan? Okay. <laughs> Any other discussion? I'll, I'll make the motion with the couple of changes that were made by our directors, I believe. There's a vote that, that we want to add a uh, freight to the rail quarter item, right? Just to modify from CSX rail quarter. So it's not limited to CSX. Not, so it's not limited. Not just limited to CSX, but, I would, but regional We're only going to add the word freight, not take CSX. CSX off. Right. Yeah. I, I really think we need to keep that there. Right. Maybe CSX yeah. slash yeah. freight. Yeah. Rail quarter. Right. We just can do CSX slash Yeah, I just freight. don't think we should take that off. Right. Only because, you know. Yeah. So, motion with that change. Any further discussion on the motion? And there's a second somewhere? Second. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. And that brings us to our third item 2018 Tabata MPO CCC Regional Multi Use Trail Priority Projects. And the first one is the review of the 2018 Regional Multi-Use Trail Priorities, and we have Mr. Reynolds. Yes, Wade Reynolds, Hillsborough MPO staff. Uh, this is just one addition uh, to the uh, priority list that you approved earlier this year. It is for the Howard Franklin Bridge Trail um, on the uh, northbound span there. Uh, you've seen this picture before. This is uh, how the new bridge uh, would work along with the trail on the uh, northernmost side. And uh, just one more uh, slide to show uh, where it has been accomplished before in um, the state of Florida. Uh, the Pensacola Bay Bridge uh, recently, uh, when reconstructed, uh, had an inclusion. Um, the uh, Hillsborough County and Pinellas County Bicycle Pedestrian and Advisory committees have um, asked FDOT to include this uh, in the work program, and um, we thank FDOT for this addition. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. Questions? Is there any chance of our pedestrian bridges looking like this? <laughs> 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 or something at least creative and 
Um, I, I have, I think it's very early in uh, design for how this would um, uh, fit in. I, I can't speak to the design of the bridge itself, but uh, in, in conversations with SDOT, some amenities such as bump outs for safety, um, as, as you see in the- can, um, Is there any way that we can just suggest or resolve as a board that we'd like to see the design uh, enhanced or embellished or somehow, you know, I, I mean, I, I think, I don't want to see it just look like a concrete expressway across the bay because no one ever said anything about what it should look like. Mm -hmm. That's all. Like that? Yeah, like that. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking district, here. district 7 uh, uh, responded to us, I think, uh, last month in a letter uh, that they would work with us during the design process. So I think I think that door is open for that conversation. That would be great. It'll be, a design, it'll be a design build procurement, so we can put something in there to encourage the bidders to present options that would be Because some of the newly constructed work is beautiful along yeah. the expressway, and it would be great to have the well, When you see a lot of the bridges like that, a lot of the, the what looks like a structure is really an architectural feature. It's not a structural feature, but it looks like a, mm -hmm. so there's lots of ways they can now do things, even without having to design a much more complex bridge, they can make it look much better. So. Any other questions or comments? I'd ask the question of the um, thought process on connecting to the local trails on each side of the Howard Franklin as to where that fits in and what the status may be there? Um, yes, we met last week on the uh, Hillsborough County side with a number of stakeholders. Uh, the connections are included in the list. Uh, it, it mentions that, the priority list. And as it gets to the Hillsborough County side, um, we, we do have a, a relatively easy connection into Cypress Point Park, where um, the new path, which connects from the Courtney Campbell Causeway uh, Trail, then to the south to um, Cypress Point, it would connect there, which is very close to the Hillsborough County terminus of um, the Howard Franklin. And on the Pinellas side? We've also started some conversations as well um, about the 4th Street corridor, okay. looking at the bridges there. So that's something we need to work with DOT on, but we have some ideas. And okay. Your city staff, we've been working with them as well. Great. Other questions or comments? Okay. Um, we have any public comment? No public comment. And once again, we get to uh, the CCC members. Uh, is there a motion? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Reynolds. Our next item is Roman numeral 5-4. Um, Tabata MPO CCC Public Participation Measures of Effectiveness. And we have Mr. Case. Thank you, I know that's a mouthful. Good morning, everyone. Michael Case, T Bar staff. Uh, I'm going to switch gears here from a lot of the things we've been talking about and cover something we haven't discussed very much with this group uh, very often, and that's regional public participation. Uh, it seems a bit of an anomaly. How do you engage the public at a regional level, uh, which I'm going to talk about throughout this presentation? Uh, but more specifically, uh, what have we been doing uh, over the past couple of years with regional public involvement? and how well have we been doing it? Uh, to echo Dave Sobush briefly, uh, if we don't measure it, we can't improve it. Uh, so I'm gonna go through this very quickly, uh, considering the time. We do have hard copies of this report, which cover the details. Uh, if you would like one, if I could get a show of hands, and I'll have uh, Mr. Hugh Pasco bring one around to you. Uh, I might add briefly that if you're looking for some uh, interesting Saturday afternoon reading. Uh, this might not be the report. Uh, so very briefly, some project background. This was sponsored by the Hillsborough County MPO. 
and it covers activities for the eight county region from January 1st, 2014 to December 31st, 2015. Uh, there are three distinct parts to this project. Uh, one was the first that I just mentioned, uh, which is collecting, evaluating, comparing the performance data against a previous report that was conducted in 2012. Uh, the second part is looking at the currently separate public participation plans between the CCC and T BARDA and figuring out how we can merge them together in one consolidated document. Uh, as you're aware, uh, we've merged the two organizations together with the CCC as a committee of T BARDA, uh, which consolidated our planning efforts. So it seems a natural progression for us to also look at merging our public participation efforts as well. Uh, the third was establishing a regional working group uh, comprised of representatives from each of the MPOs as well as TBARDA to come together on an ad hoc basis to discuss ways that we can engage the public in a cost-effective way. So how did we get here? The original CCC PIP was developed in the year 2000. Uh, report measures of effectiveness reports have been conducted biennially since 2006. Uh, TBARDA developed its public engagement and education plan in 2009 for its first master plan. Uh, those efforts were included under non-voting partner activities in the 2010 and 2012 MOE evaluations. Uh, in 2016, the CCC and TBARDA merged together uh, its planning activities, uh, allowing for the integration of public participation activities as well. Uh, and as I mentioned, the Hillsborough County MPO sponsored this project. Um, and following on how we uh, have our staff services agreement with them, uh, we also signed an executed an agreement to conduct this project. So very briefly, the 2012 report uh, it identified four areas of improvement uh, for the next reporting period, which we currently um, completed. Uh, those were communication technology. Uh, at the time, you know, social media was evolving as a more effective and common way to engage people. Uh, support for the JCAC, uh, maintaining quorums, uh, and instructing presenters to explain the relevance of topics, uh, the regional relevance of topics to citizens in plain language, uh, making use of advancing communications technologies to uh, address funding issues for travel and print costs, and continuing to build partnerships such as those that we have with you, the MPOs, uh, as well as the TMA, uh, transit agencies, and transportation management organizations in the region as well. So very quickly, some quick meeting stats for the review period. Uh, obviously one of the ways we engage the public is through meetings. Uh, both the TBARDA board and CCC board uh, maintain quorums 100% uh, of the time during the reporting period. Uh, and they also received, recorded, and responded to public comments uh, where appropriate. Public hearings are distinct from public meetings in that they have a specific action that requires input from the public. Uh, so we've made sure to sep separate those out here. Uh, the CCC and Team Barty each had three public hearings during the reporting period uh, and met all of the requirements that are mandated by law for public hearings. In line with what was done in the 2012 MOE report, a survey was conducted with the JCAC. Uh, we conducted a very similar survey uh, with the CAC as well as some JCAC members as well, of course, asking them for their feedback on how well they felt. Uh, we addressed issues, uh, brought regional topics uh, of relevance to their attention between the reporting period, as I previously stated. We had 24 respondents out of 35, most of which were from Pinellas County, but we had at least someone from each county with the exception of Sarasota. Uh, questions centered around two general categories, uh, how agenda packets, uh, uh, what information they included, uh, as well as their distribution, and the experience of attending meetings. So quickly, these two topics uh, for agenda packets and distribution, the good, uh, the majority of members did report that they received agenda topics in a timely manner, and by that I mean at least a week or more in advance. Uh, they responded that they were also written in plain, easily understandable language and contained relevant topics to both regional and local interests. 
However, there were some minority ports within this survey, uh, and we've identified those under some need, in, needs improvement areas. So one was we had a couple of respondents that said that they didn't receive agendas a week or more in advance. So now that could be for a variety of reasons. They could have not been checking their email very often, or we very well could have had the wrong email listed. Uh, I'll go over some recommendations from these two areas later on in the report. But, uh, so experience of attending meetings, overall respondents did believe staff was accommodating responsive to their requests and needs, and that their time was well spent in meetings. Uh, again, a couple of minority reports, reports in here uh, that we identified as things that need improvement. Uh, some responded that they didn't always feel that the group or members of the group approach decision making with a regional perspective in mind. Um, and again, this will translate into some recommendations later on in the report. We also looked at how we're doing with web and social media. Again, something that's been emerging over the past couple of years, particularly over the last few, as more and more people seek and consume information through mobile devices and through the internet. Uh, and again, I'll just preface this with the fact that I'll go over it quickly and the details are in the written report. So a quick overview, uh, specific functions of the TBARDA website and the CCC, CCC webpage do include links to member agencies, uh, library of plans, documents, and maps, uh, meeting calendar for uh, regional meetings, archived agendas and minutes back to 2012, uh, an email link for more information about TBARDA and the CCC, as well as instructions and forms for citizens who want to submit Title VI or limited English proficiency requests for assistance or complaints. For engagement, we're actually doing pretty well. Uh, we had an average of two minutes and 45 seconds and three pages per visit during the reporting period. Uh, that means people are coming to the TBARDA website and they're staying there for almost three minutes and they're looking around, they're reading, they're downloading documents, uh, and they visit a couple of pages, uh, likely before they find what it is that they're looking for. During the reporting period, we had 24,144 total users. Out of those, 35.6% were new and never had, never had been previously to the site. So that is also good news because we are continuing to expand our audience. Performance-wise, isn't the same story. Uh, not so good. We used a tool called Google Page Speed Insights, which uh, evaluates a page based on its load time. Uh, the standard metric uh, that Google has developed for people uh, when they're visiting a page is that it must load within about three seconds. So uh, that's translated into a score out of 100 based on various factors and you know if, if images have been optimized and they'll load properly. So. Uh, the TBARDA site overall ranks poorly at 44 out of 100. Uh, the mobile site load time is even worse at 36 out of 100. Now, probably don't need to tell you this if you've ever tried to visit the TBARDA website from your phone. Uh, so, what we want to do is score of 85 or above indicates a good page performance. And I said three seconds, the actual metric is two seconds or less for that load time. So the most visited pages on the TBARDA site, number one was about TBARDA, two, the master plan overview, regional school commute program, followed by the TBARDA calendar and the TBARDA My Ride page. For the CCC website specifically, uh, that was the ninth most visited page on the site with just under 2,000 visits. Uh, so we looked at where those visits were coming from. 41% uh, of them came from search results, meaning that someone typed into Google uh, regional planning or CCC and they clicked on the link that took them to the CCC page. 38 came from another site with a link in it. Uh, and those typically were uh, links from the MPO pages or some of our partners as well. Uh, others came from direct links, social media and email re referrals, uh, which aren't often as detailed, but again, the details of this, where we have them, are available in the report. Search engine use, this is important because uh, different search engines use different criteria uh, for web pages. So uh, if you design a page a particular way for uh, Explorer, 
whereas I often call it exploder, uh, it won't load it the same way that Google Chrome often does. So uh, there are ways that you, you need to approach site design that are a balance between them so that it shows up consistently between a variety of, of uh, search browsers. So uh, what we did, we looked over time at uh, what trends have changed. Uh, back in 2012, Internet Exploder was the highest uh, used search engine. Uh, you can see Chrome slowly taking over that, um, and Safari uh, also growing in popularity as well. Uh, in 2012, uh, Mozilla Firefox was also <coughs> one of the most commonly used browsers, which if I included that information here, it would be about 0.6% now at this point. So uh, what, what we're saying with this is that, you know, we of course, uh, you know, knowing this is important, that we need to make sure that we're designing pages appropriately for a variety of search browsers. Uh, we looked at our social media use as well. Uh, as I briefly mentioned at the beginning of the report here in the presentation, uh, social media signals are emerging as a uh, much more important uh, factor than it used to be. Uh, more people are consuming information through social media uh, and it's growing faster as a source of information than any other medium out there. So, uh, and that shows in 2012, uh, social media accounted for 0.6% of all web traffic to the T-BARTA website. By 2015, it accounted for 2.43%. That doesn't sound like a lot, but it is a significant increase over just a few years. And down below, you can see the traffic trends by year, uh, where specifically they're coming from. Uh, the primary uh, medium for social media is Facebook, uh, for, a, for a variety of reasons. It's often user-friendly. Uh, you can include images along with text. Um, and there is a wide uh, demographic that uses it. Uh, so Twitter is growing as well. Um, it actually was, uh, I'm sorry, I take that back. Twitter's not growing. It was 18% in 2014, is down to 6% now. So, so Facebook really has the lion's share of the market as far as social media is concerned. Uh, we also looked at what regional publications we, pr we produced over the past few years. Uh, those included, of course, the 2015 T. Barter Master Plan, uh, we also produced fact sheets for the Regional Future Priority Projects. Uh, we put together a report along with the Florida Transportation Commission every year on our projects and what we've accomplished. Uh, so there were two reports uh, that we uh, put together and distributed with them. Uh, we also put together, uh, well, at the time it was a daily transportation e-newsletter, which included stories of regional relevance, which we distributed through a listserv uh, developed through MailChimp. Uh, we got and have been getting very good responses to that. Uh, the list has grown to over 2,000 subscribers, um, and the open rate is 26.2% with an industry average of 24.16%. Now, if you're not familiar with an open rate is, it means you saw the link, you clicked on it, and that's what counts for an open rate. Uh, we do regularly distribute the link for people to sign up for the list uh, so they can receive the newsletter as well. Uh, the last thing uh, that T. Barta produced specifically was the Regional School Commute Program, uh, which details a part of our commuter assistance program where we match parents together to get them to, to share a ride to and from school, and that's within FDOT District 7. CCC developed multi-use trails brochures in 2014 and 2015, as well as a regional road network map in 2015. So one of the things uh, that we uh, looked at closer with guidance from our working group was uh, cost-benefit analysis of some of the uh, online tools that are most often used with public engagement for planning and projects. Uh, this is important because there are a plethora of tools available out there. Um, and this list probably needs to be, be expanded upon, but we took the most popular ones, uh, distinguished them between two different types. So are they an awareness raising tool or are they an involvement tool? Uh, awareness basically lets people know that the, there's the existence of a meeting, a project, or a plan. Involvement takes it uh, steps further and asks them back for input and is able to record that input. So uh, the takeaway for this is with all the tools available, it's important to know uh, depending on uh, what kind of outcome you want, how many people you need to reach, 
uh, and what the cost is of it. And out of that, what kind of benefit are you getting? What return are you getting for the money? So re to return back briefly to the 2012 goals, uh, we're comparing those with some of the things that we did in 2015 under communications technologies. Uh, T-BART and the CCC regularly use social media and other electronic outreach platforms to reach a broad audience. For the CAC, uh, one of the problems that was identified in the JCAC survey conducted in 2012 was that there was an issue with attaining quorums. That issue has persisted with the T-BARDA, so it's something that we're, and I will cover this, uh, going to recommend an improvement upon. Uh, to help with that issue, T-BARDA has consistently used teleconferencing as a way for the CAC to participate. However, in order to count toward a quorum, there must be a physical attendance there by voting members. So uh, what's happened with the CAC, because we've been able to achieve a quorum most of the time, they end up coming to a consensus and making a recommendation based on consensus to the board where needed. Uh, to address the issue of presenters coming from a regional perspective, uh, they are and regularly uh, have been routinely instructed by staff to present the context of the big picture and explain where applicable uh, the local impacts of their projects. Two more uh, reductions in available funding. Uh, again, you know, we are using social media and electronic means to cut back on print costs. Uh, we've also been leveraging some partnerships that we have with the Central Florida MPOAC. Uh, and with FDOT as well to help us find locations for meetings, for example, uh, that don't cost us. And thank you again to PSTA for uh, providing the location for today's meeting. Uh, so uh, some of the other locations, USF, uh, Tampa Port Authority, FDOT District 7, Embassy Suites. Uh, accessible locations are of course important as well. Uh, ADA compliance is always a consideration, so making sure that people that have a need uh, can properly access the meeting. Uh, partnerships, t and CCC have partnered uh, typically on an ad hoc basis with various community and business organizations, uh, including the Tampa Bay Partnership, which thank you again for their presentation today, as well as Innovation Place, uh, Tampa International Airport, and the Port Authority as well. All right. So closing this up, uh, goals and recommendations. Uh, we have uh, several here that are coming out of the report, uh, and I'll go through these quickly. Uh, we're proposing uh, with community business partnerships uh, that we invite at least four existing or new partners to attend TVARTA and or TVARTA MPOCCC board meetings and recognize them at those meetings, uh, giving them a chance to voice uh, you know, if they have an opinion on a particular project, program, or plan, giving them the opportunity. Um, and that's very much what we're doing here today. Uh, a couple for website and social media. Uh, we need a social media strategy that leverages cost efficiency of available and of applicable platforms. How many uh, goals do we have? Uh, there are seven total. Okay, I'll ask you to speed it up a little bit if we can. Okay, okay. <laughs> I can do that. So I, I won't go over the recommendations in that case. So again, the details are in the report if you'd like to see them. Uh, we need to increase, increase the user friendliness of the T-BARTA site, uh, making it load faster, making it more aesthetically pleasing. Uh, we need to, of course, as I previously, previously mentioned, it increase voting member attendance, which can be done in a variety of ways. Uh, but we are asking in the report uh, to improve quorum attain attainment from one third of the time to at least half of the time within the next reporting period. Uh, we also need to consistently distribute CAC agenda packets, which we think we can do through uh, simplifying how we put them together. Two more goals, uh, increasing the percentage of members that feel the committee uh, conducted decision-making from a regional perspective. 70% uh, of members felt that that was the case, so we'd like to increase that, as well as those that felt that they received proper training for their regional roles and responsibilities. Last goal, encourage TAC members to actively participate providing feedback and presentations on agenda items, which involves likely upgrading our teleconferencing capabilities to video so that they can follow, on, follow along with presentations as they're being given. There are some other recommendations as well, which if you'd like to see those, you can go to the report. And at this time, I'll take any questions or comments that you might have. Thank you. Um, let me see if we have any public comment on engaging the public. <laughs> okay, public comment is closed. Uh, questions, comments? Jack. 
Quick question. Um, as far as your downloading time, what are you doing to improve that to get it to that 85 number? Right, so that's in the recommendations. We need to make sure that images are optimized, uh, meaning that uh, you can uh, downsize them to a proper resolution so they don't take a long time to load. Uh, you can also tag images as well properly so that if someone is searching for something that it pops up within a reasonable amount of time. Um, there are a variety of metrics that are available in PageSpeed, PageSpeed Insights. Uh, when you run a test on each individual page, it actually gives you a set of recommendations on how you can improve. So is that plan for yet? Or? Yes, that is. That's part of the plan. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions or comments before we open it up for the CCC discussion? And the other thing, Mr. Case, we need to just do a uh, notice that the 45-day public comment period will open for the Regional Public Participation Plan and will close on January 26, 2018 at the Tabato Board meeting. Yes, that's correct. And the recommendations of this report influence how we put together the Regional Public Participation Plan for TBARDA in the CCC. So we're asking today for the Measures and Effectiveness Report to be uh, approved by the CCC and that it be carried forward to the TBARDA Board for final approval in January. Okay, we'll go to the CCC voting members. Any additional questions or comments? A motion? So moved. A second? Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Case. Apologize for uh, moving you along. Um, we have additional business, uh, regional targets for safety. Um, uh, a separate item. We do have one very short, hopefully, uh, presentation. Sorry, Johnny. And if I will help me out too, we do have a report. A lot of the material we're going to be covering in is very abbreviated presentation. If Michael would help me uh, hand those out to people who would like, like that report. Really, it's kind of a one-two punch. What Michael talked about were the measures of how you assess what, how you assess the effectiveness of public participation. What I want to talk about is the fact that everyone is familiar with what you do in your own jurisdiction regarding uh, public involvement. What we have to do, and it's a very unique challenge, is regional public involvement. And let me tell you, there is a difference. The fact that we all have to get together, we do our own programs, but then we come together and we really try to say what's going on in our own different areas and how do they correlate with each other. And it really isn't that difficult. What we have set up is a regional in the presentation here. We have a rich, what we have originally called a regional working group for public involvement. And here, down arrow, the down arrow. Let's see that. Very good. And I'm going to cover these, you know, fairly quickly here. We have objectives to the report. We have regional decision making. That was really the reason we're here. And we need truly regional public participation. That's a hard thing to get. We cover a tremendously large area. I think, again, generally 100 by 200 miles. How do we get really people to comment on all the different things that are overlapping or even very different within the entire area? What we are looking really to do is to take the two processes we have now, which Ibarda does in a very effective and I think a very active public involvement program, and actually then consolidate that with what we've been doing with the CCC. And I think that really is really the foundation of what we're trying to do today and one of the main things we're trying to do with the public hearing process. We all know that we have a hierarchy of decision making within the area. I think we're all pretty much familiar with that. What it goes through, it goes through the public, the art, I'll use an acronym here, RP3. It's Regional Public Participation, and then it goes to the staff directors, we're familiar with that, it goes up to the CCC board, but eventually everything that we do with public involvement eventually ends up all the way at the top of the, of the uh, Tea Party Governing Board. Hardest thing that we have to do is get the message out of the regional level. What is really effective regional communication? And again, too, you can have your own things going on in your own area, going on in another area, but again, taking a look at the commonality of the message we have. And we have a very good message. The problem is, again, getting it out to our own local groups, making it really to make sense within the context of what we're trying to do here within the Tampa Bay area, and then come out with really some kind of a coalesced, consolidated, cooperative plan from public involvement. 
that really gets people engaged in the conversation that we need to be having, not only within our own areas, but for the entire Tampa Bay, West Central Florida area. I'm not going to go through all these, obviously, but I, I want to point out one thing, and this is, a, this is something that every MPO group around the state of Florida and around the nation, and we talk to a lot of people too, the MPO brand, and then when you're looking at the CCC and PMA, PMA, is never going to be widely recognized. We've all seen that problem. You can ask people, you know, what really are we? And if you're involved in it, you know, again, you're part of the choir here, obviously you know what that is. But a lot of times it's even hard saying, well, why do you have one group doing one thing, having another group doing another? Getting that message out to the people and really getting them involved takes one thing. It doesn't take public involvement, it takes public engagement. And what we're really trying to do is say that we're, we need to be out there as a group talking with all levels of groups, all levels of citizens, and there are a lot of them out there that really want to be involved in the process, but they really do not know how to be involved in the process. Michael talked a lot about a lot of the tools that we have, social media, uh, there are a lot of things that we commonly do. We have public hearings, we have town halls and everything, but when I talk to people, particularly the Atlanta area, the Denver area, and a couple of them, they go out and they do very, what I would call non-traditional outreach methods that we can really build upon with our regional advisory group. But it's gonna take all of the MPOs really working together and doing a lot of the heavy lifting to say that we can go out in our area, we can arrange these things, but then we can let everyone else, and the, the communication is really important, we can let everybody else in the area, our own group, know what we're doing, participate, see how that, see how that really works for them. And again, it's engaging a wide audience over a very wide area. Uh, this is what Atlanta does. They have a very extensive program. I think, again, one of the better examples that we can really kind of learn a lot from. They have a, recent, a regional advisory group taking with the people that really do public involvement all throughout the area. We need to get those people involved on a very continual basis in this. This is really our regional public participation plan, the RP3 group that we really want to become involved as a very active component of regional public, in, uh, people can, public involvement. To give you an idea about how much you do in Atlanta, it's a large area, we have to admit that. They have had over 22,000 interactions over the last two and a half year period as they were developing their plans. But they went out and did all types of workshops. They really concentrated on different aspects of what they know are the real mobility challenges within their own areas. And I apologize for interrupting you, but we're about a half hour past where we were scheduled I'm going to. Move, to okay. Give me a couple more, and I promise, Mr. Chair, I will be done. Thank you. And we have intended outcomes. We are creating a single consolidated entity with, again, all of the partners that you know, your own staff. And again, this really depends upon our own staff actually doing, like I said, the heavy lifting within the entire program. We want to move, and this is important, what we've been looking at, we want to be sure we are having an attitude of moving from competition to cooperation. And not only everything we do as a regional group, but really for public involvement too. I'm not going to go through that. We've already talked about that, Michael did, about all the different tools that we have out there. But we really want to go back and look at all the tools and make sure that they're applicable something the commonality of what we all share within the area if you're only trying to do a regional public involvement you can't deal with the problem in one area you have to show how these things are working together to build mobility for the entire area and that again is what we have to continually work for we want to have supporting strategies we want to have actions that really show us how and i'm not going to really go through all these i guarantee you i have a whole bunch of slides that show and we've gone into all of the detail of objectives strategies and actions that we're really going to be putting into place with the R with the RP3 advisory group, and you can provide that to our executive directors, and they can filter it down to the. We members. are going to do that, sir. Absolutely, and this is it. We have projects that really need this level of involvement, this level of activity and support, really from the ground up. 
We're going to be looking at the coordination structure. We're all aware of that. That's going to be going on over the next year. We have a regional transit development plan, a long range plan. And what we really need to be doing, we need to be creating additional regional awareness of what this group is doing. Get the message out, understand the market, and understand the people that have to be involved. So that's it. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Last thing we need to do is review the last page of the agenda, which has the meeting dates uh, for 2018. For those of you who will be participating in 2018. There's one other presentation. What do you want to? Yeah, just, we need to just approve these dates. Um, unless anybody has any conflict about the dates. Approve. OK. Is that a CCC? Yes. Do we still have a quorum for, so I guess I'm the alternate for Peter Reen. Cover for Pinellas. OK. So we have a motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. Okay. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Beth, can we, do we need to do this, or can we? Wait, back. I think we're just running out of seconds. patience. Sure. I asked uh, Johnny to just flip to the very last uh, slide in the presentation just so that you can see the numbers. You have copies of all of the slides at your places. There's federally required mandates for us to set safety targets, five performance measures. We have used the methodology that I'm not going to explain because it would take longer than 60 seconds. But the, Good slide show. the targets that we're proposing <laughs> for the entire region are on the last page. Um, just for your knowledge, and I'm going to use my six seconds here. Expecting 900 fatalities across the eight county region in calendar year 2018, almost 8,000 serious injuries, almost 1,000 non motorized bike ped fatalities and serious injuries. Our rate is pretty high uh, across, this, uh, across the entire state, and even higher when you consider the entire nation. And our rate of serious injur injuries is astronomical. Um, so, not good things. We're horizon, number one. We're no we've got a lot of work to do, and that's why Vision Zero is something that we should all get behind and support. Thank you very much. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry to uh, speed up any questions or comments. Otherwise, uh, for those of us who are still here, we're adjourned. <laughs>